second timing and then you can begin anytime. Okay. And, um, There's Laura. Okay. Um, is Brick coming on or? Yes, he will be joining us momentarily. Okay. Let me see if I can get this right. Give Laura another second or two. I'm ready. Ready? Oh yeah. I'm here. Okay, welcome to the city council special meeting, cannabis and smoking regulation, excuse me, restrictions workshop for this Wednesday, January 13th, 2021. I'd like to uh, do the flag salute. Do we have a flag coming up? Okay. Everybody can place your hand over the heart and Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag. flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This meeting will be conducted pursuant to the provisions of the governor's executive order N29-20 and the orders of the Ventura County Public Health Officer issued March 20th, 2020, stay well at home order. Do we like to do a roll call? Council member Martinez? Present. Council member Hernandez? Present. Council member Perez? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins. <laughs> we'll get you unmuted, sir. Here. And Mayor Gama. Here. All present. Thank you. Welcome to the special city council meeting workshop on January 13th, 2021. We are conducting this meeting pursuant to the provisions of the governor's executive order. N2920 and the orders of the Ventura County Public Health Officers Stay Well at Home, order dated March 20th, 2020. The council chambers have been closed to the public and council members and staff are participating remotely to help play our part in minimizing the spread of COVID-19. The public was informed in advance of the meeting how to submit all public comments to our city clerk. The city clerk has compiled all submissions and those received prior to 5 p.m. deadline today were forwarded um, to the entire city council for review prior to the meeting. They will also be read into and part of the official meeting record. Members of the public have been afforded the opportunity to participate in the workshop via a provided Zoom link and their participation is highly encouraged. Um, do we have public comments tonight, Madam Clerk? Sure, we have no general public comments and we have no public comments for item number one, but we have three public comments for item number two. Okay. So we'll read those following the presentation for item number two. Okay, before we start this meeting, I would like to uh, briefly make a public comment. Um, for the second time in as many two months, we've had a violent crime in our city. And the positive takeaway is that Wainimi PD in both instances performed beyond anybody's best expectations. And for that, our city council and our residents are truly grateful. We are extremely fortunate to have a able-bodied police department that <clears throat> gets the job done when the situation is tense and violent and I can't not express enough our gratitude to our police department and the way they've handled these two situations have been exemplary. And I wanna thank the chief very much for being a part of our organization and, and uh, being the head of a, a wonderful organization as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, 
I uh, appreciate that. And I know my officers in this department does as well. Welcome. Okay, we already did the roll call and we don't have any general comments for this section. So I am going to introduce our chief of police to present the Cannabis Community Workshop, Review and Discussion. Chief, so, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, I'm gonna interrupt you because I was gonna do a couple of facilitation slides just for the benefit of our public prior to the two item presentation. Yes, and thank you, Christy. You did tell me ahead of time. <laughs> thank you, sorry, Chief, I'll just take a minute. Share my screen here. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. So welcome to our city council workshop. There are several ways to participate in tonight's meeting. Uh, since this is a public participation, and we are encouraging the public to participate. Uh, we are hoping that uh, this will help facilitate them to have several options to participate tonight. There's a call-in option, um, making special note of that meeting ID and passcode. I will also be putting this information into the chat bar feature so that it's accessible um, and hopefully um, available to the public. There's also a website link. Um, if you log on to our city's website, you'll see down here there's an agenda and minutes little um, icon tab. If you click on that, it will take you to a different website that you can um, pull up the agenda for tonight's meeting or by date. And uh, I'll give you a view of that in just a moment. We also have technical help. Um, our IT manager has so nicely uh, volunteered to um, provide some technical assistance to anybody who might be having difficulties tonight. Uh, his email address will be listed one more time. So if you don't catch it now, there will be another opportunity. And uh, of course we can click on the join Zoom meeting. I'm gonna show you where to find that. Uh, definitely don't expect that you'll be able to write that down. So let me show you where you can find that. Once you go to the agendas tab and select the meeting date for January 13th, it will take you to this screen. Uh, this is the top heading of our agenda. You'll notice the blue link for the title. We'll, it's a link that will take you directly to the Zoom meeting, as well as it's listed down here for anybody that needs to copy and paste that if for some reason that link isn't working. And also just a little brief reminder for anybody who's not um, completely familiar with our agendas, each of the items is also a link and it will take you to the applicable reports for each council business item tonight. So if you wanna review those, agenda reports, you have the opportunity to click on those links and see the additional um, linked items to those. Uh, for our virtual meeting tonight, this meeting is being recorded by site, so we can't participate. If you don't wish your video to be on screen, um, on the next slide, I'll, I'll provide a, a brief um, overview of how to turn your video off. And there will be a question and answer session at the end of each presentation. So we're hoping to let the presenters get through their entire um, PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll um, open it up to a question and answer session. All microphones are going to be muted for the duration of the presentation, and they'll remain muted. But if you do want to speak, once we open it up for the question and answer, um, there's a couple different ways that you can do that. There's a raise your hand option um, by using the participants icon. And again, on the next screen, I'll show you where to find that. And you can also use the chat feature to, to type in and ask a question. So we'll be using those two ways um, to let the public and council members participate. And during the question and answer, you'll be unmuted by the host as soon as we get to you. So um, here's the Zoom toolbar. At the top of your screen, you'll see all the different icons. And again, if you wanna stop your video, um, you'll select those icons to turn it on and off and uh, we'll be doing the muting and unmuting for you. On the participants screen, this is where you'll raise your hand. So there's a little, a little bar that um, will pop up and give you the option to raise your hand. And you can also see the different participants. 
Under the chat feature, this is where if you want to write down a question that we can um, see during the presentation or during the question and answer session, um, it will pop up a little bar. You'll notice that there's the current setting is for everybody. So whatever you type into that chat session will be view, uh, viewable by everybody. But there are these little ellipses give you um, a drop down where you can just contact the host. So you can send a private message if you need to. There's a speaker view and gallery view. So if you want to click on the speaker view, that will show you um, just the person who is the main speaker. And gallery view will show you kind of a tile of everybody, all the participants at once. And of course, that big red button um, will allow you to leave at any time. And thank you for your patience. As we get to question and answer session, we're gonna do our best to um, help facilitate if we have um, a lot of members of the public participating. And uh, again, thank you for, for joining us tonight. We are happy to have you. And Chief, that is all from me. So back to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christy. So I'm gonna immediately just bring up uh, my presentation. And, and get started. Um, uh, I hope to have the presentation uh, complete in less than 30 minutes. Uh, there's quite a bit of information in here and I felt it was important, especially with two new council members, is to really uh, establish a working foundation uh, because they'll be involved in questions uh, now for the next uh, four years. Uh, as it relates to cannabis and, and where we go with our cannabis program. And so let me see here, let me try this. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, the purpose of this workshop is really to kind of get some guidance and some direction from council as to the state of cannabis in Port Wainini. Uh, we've been involved with cannabis now uh, nearing our three year anniversary. Our first dispensary opened up in January of 2018. So yes, it's already been three years. Um, and so um, this is really our first opportunity since the opening of the dispensary to really discuss uh, the state of cannabis as a council and as a community uh, to see where we wanna guide ourselves over the next uh, few years and to talk about you know, uh, things like saturation and over concentration, uh, what's happening in our neighboring jurisdictions such as Oxnard and Ventura, um, and what are some of our options uh, in terms of cannabis staffing with opening up uh, over 20 cannabis related businesses in the city, do we need additional staffing uh, to help uh, with that increase? And I wanted to share with you some of the best practices that we have been uh, doing over the last three years uh, that other cities have mirrored and just really to kind of show how we've customized our program and, and made it something uh, really different here for others uh, to actually use as a, as a model. And then at the very end, uh, there's going to be some options uh, for council to provide me with some guidance and so I can come back with a formalized proposal at a subsequent council meeting uh, in terms of uh, what we would like to do with our cannabis program. Uh, so that's that's really the crux of what we're doing here uh, today. Uh, and I'll get through the presentation. There's a lot of information, especially uh, foundational information. Um, uh, I can email the presentation to everyone after we're all done uh, this evening. Uh, so you'll have that at your fingertips uh, because um, I would like everyone on the council to be as well versed on this information as possible, especially as the community often has uh, questions. And then for our two council members, the newer ones, uh, if you'd ever like a tour of any of our dispensaries, uh, please let me know and I'd be more than happy uh, to provide you with a tour because uh, it is very enlightening in terms of how everything is laid out, especially if you haven't been in a dispensary and how they exactly work because there's a lot of misconceptions and misnomers. Um, and that also goes for any of our um, council, older council members uh, who um, maybe have gone on a, tour before and would like to do it again. Um, so with that, I'm gonna get right into the history, kind of how we got uh, where we got to and what makes this uh, so special. Uh, this first slide is really not to challenge uh, 
your knowledge of poor white Amy, but is really to kind of set kind of how we are different than any of the other cities in the county as well as the state. Um, and so as you can see here, uh, we are one of the few cities really in the state, I can't think of too many, that are completely encapsulated by another city. Uh, and in this case, it's the city of Oxnard. You can't get into out of the city of Port Wainimi without uh, driving through the city of Oxnard. Obviously, the I mean, you could come in through the ocean, but in terms of just regular traffic, you can't come into our city without going through Oxnard. We are 4.5 square miles, but 60% of that is consumed by our, our, our local base here. Um, our population is uh, just under 24,000 people. Uh, we account for 2.8% of the county population, and we have approximately 7,700 households in the city of Port Wainimi. So what made this very unique and why the council was very challenged with finding revenue uh, some years ago is, as you can see, is we're very small. Uh, we don't have any big brand stores, very big retail stores, auto centers. We are the only city in the county not to have the freeway running through it. Um, and so these are some of the challenges that we were uh, dealt with. And so council decided some years ago um, while it may have been unorthodox at the time, uh, because not many cities were doing it, was to venture into allowing cannabis to operate in the city of Port Wainimi. So with that, in 2015, the state approved medicinal cannabis uh, by passing the Medical Cannabis Regulation and S Safety Act. Soon thereafter, uh, Proposition 64 passed and the Adult Use uh, Marijuana Act uh, was passed. And then in 2017, both of these acts and regulations were, were brought together and formed uh, what's called the Medical and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation Safety Act. So following that, the city in, in they actually, actually say July 5th of 2015, uh, adopted city ordinance 727 and we became the first dispensary first dispense, first city of Ventura County to recognize and allow for the sale, distribution, manufacturing, cultivation, and delivery of medicinal cannabis. Soon thereafter, in January of 2018, we adapted an additional ordinance, which then would allow for adult use, or what's commonly referred to as recreational cannabis in the city of Port Wainini. Approximately two weeks after that, our first dispensary opened up January 29th of 2018. That was Skunk Masters Dispensary. Uh, the very first six months, they were medicinal only because the council had placed a moratorium on recreational for the first six months while the city and the police department adapted to these dispensaries beginning to open. Uh, so recreational became uh, legal or allowed, I should say, uh, in June of 2018. So I talked about us becoming the model program in the state of California and what we did differently. And one of the things that we focused on was customizing a program for our community. We weren't about to grab a template from San Jose or Oakland or San Diego and LA and, and just drop this cookie cutter template here and just say, uh, let's get rolling. Uh, we didn't do that. Um, I personally did site visits in Phoenix, San Diego, and Los Angeles uh, to help us customize our program to see what was working best in those communities and bring in a lot of that here. So what we decided to do, since we were gonna be the first city in the county to open up uh, cannabis dispensaries, we wanted to take that leadership position. We knew people were gonna be looking at us and we wanted to um, make sure we got it right. And so we did that by really coordinating and setting up a regulatory framework that would um, work for our community and, and especially protect it. So our goal was to be the model cannabis licensing program in the county and the state. And we would accomplish this by carefully screening each one of our applications. Uh, this was also combined with the public input through our conditional use permit process and all the law enforcement initiatives that you'll hear about uh, towards the end of this presentation. And as you'll quickly hear is we developed a cannabis contribution program whereby all cannabis businesses operating in Port Wainimi would commit to giving 1% of all gross sales to community programs 
um, and organizations in our community. And that is something that other cities are now starting to emulate, such as the city of Oxnard. So some people think that uh, we just rubber stamp these applications and you're on your way to operating a cannabis business in the city of Port Wainimi, and that's not how it works. Uh, here you have the group of five individuals that carefully screen each application, which commonly go through several different iterations and are sent back to the applicant and we review them and then get sent back again. So it is a process. It's a very detailed uh, and specific process. As I show you here, there are 14 different elements that every applicant must address and uh, place inside of their application. As you can see by the photo right here, there's three, applica uh, three applications that had been submitted and it gives you just an example of just how big and lengthy uh, these applications are when they are submitted. So they are quite long. Uh, they take a great deal of time to review, um, but it is very detailed and we take great pride in making sure that uh, these applicants are gonna adhere to all of our conditions and they're right for our community. So what we did differently here in Port Wainimi uh, and is we created these development agreements. Normally you hear how cities pass cannabis taxes and you pretty much just submit your business license and, and you're off and running. Here, we didn't wanna do that. Uh, we made it a part of a process, a conditional use permit process. And we entered it in these development agreements with these cannabis dispensaries, whereby the city would uh, obtain 5% of their cannabis sales. And this would also allow us to place specific recommendations or conditions on the agreement um, that we set forth and that this gave us a little bit more fortitude or strength to shut them down uh, if they didn't adhere to these recommendations or conditions. So I really I really wanted just to show you just a few. Uh, the police department sets out roughly 50 conditions uh, preliminarily in, in the initial applications. Uh, some of them include that there should be no after hour gatherings or social functions at any of these dispensaries except for employee meetings and inventory. Uh, all employees are required to wear uniforms that are distinguishable from the public, as well as uh, wear ID badges around their neck. Uh, no employee shall be under the influence of alcohol or cannabis while on the premises. Uh, security guards shall be armed and in uniform. Uh, patients are not allowed to wear sunglasses, hat wear, hoodies, or any type of identification intrusion devices so we can actually capture for security reasons. Many people don't know this, but I have remote access to every single cannabis uh, dispensary in our city, 24-7, uh, 365, as well as our dispatch center. So I can actually monitor and regulate from behind my desk to make sure all of the dispensaries are adhering to the conditions that we set forth. Um, people commonly talk about odors. If there's an odor persisting outside of the dispensary or any cannabis business location, uh, they have uh, less than 24 hours to fix the problem or the business gets shut down. And then uh, another example is if we have a power outage, uh, this results in the immediate closure of the business uh, because at that time their security systems, their cameras, their alarm systems, as well as their uh, purchase uh, point of sale systems are not working. So uh, these are just some of the conditions to just share with you uh, that we place into our development agreements. Not many people know that not only do the owners have to get backgrounded and, and live scan, so do all the employees uh, at a cost of $410 uh, for each employee. Um, I don't know of too many other businesses that require live scans um, for this type of retail business. Uh, you commonly get it in the, in the police department, medical profession, lawyers but all of our cannabis dispensaries go through a FBI and DOJ live scan background check and they are also photographed. So there's this misnomer that these cannabis employees are people of questionable character uh, and that is that could be further from the truth. So thus far we have live scanned over 450 cannabis employees at $410, which has been an additional revenue source of over $184,500. And this money is used to offset the records technician position that city council approved a little over two years ago to help us um, 
with the cannabis process. So I talked about identification cards. This is something very unique that we do here in the city of Port Wyneme. We issue the identification cards to every single cannabis employee. I'm not aware of anyone else that is doing this. We do this for several reasons. It prevents the cannabis dispensary from creating their own IDs and trying to simulate that they have a legitimate employee on the premises. This prevents that. It also allows us to um, photograph the employee and track all of the employees working at each one of the dispensaries. Uh, so this has worked very, very well for us. I know a lot of you have the question, well, how many of our employees, um, cannabis employees actually work or live in the city of Port Wayne? And so this is what it looked like when we first opened up in 2018. These are the, this is the chart for the end of 2018. Um, we had 20 employees employed by the six cannabis dispensaries, and that was in March of 2019. Uh, it, at, in September of 2020, uh, that increased to uh, 31, 2019, excuse me, and now close to present day, we have over 251 people employed by our cannabis dispensary uh, between these uh, eight cannabis businesses. Uh, and 35 of them reside in the city of Port Wyneme. There is one additional business that's not on here that just opened up in November, that's Tradecraft Farms. So that number should actually be closer to about 265 total employees employed by cannabis businesses and approximately 38 that reside within the city of Port Wyneme. So let's talk about one of the big reasons why we're here and that's um, how many retail dispensaries we actually have in the city of Port Wyneme. And uh, most of them are spread out on what's been eloquently coined as the Green Mile. Uh, that is because it is exactly one mile from Ventura Road all the way down to Wheelhouse where our dispensaries are located. So it's been named the Green Mile. We currently have nine approved dispensaries in this stretch with Emerald Perspective uh, located on Pleasant Valley Road, uh, which accounts then for a total of 10 retail dispensaries that have been approved by city council up to this point. So to summarize, this is, oops, this is what it, this is what it looks like. We have eight retail storefronts, six delivery services. Uh, the Bureau of Cannabis Control calls these delivery licenses, non-retail storefronts. So there's six of them. We have one cultivator and two micro businesses that have been approved thus far. Now, keep in mind that if you're a retail storefront, you can also deliver. So really we have 14, um, actually 16 uh, businesses that can actually deliver cannabis in the city of Port Wyneme. Uh, because as you know, micro business uh, also includes retail and delivery. So here's the summary, the chart on the left of the 17 cannabis licenses that have already been approved by city council um, these past uh, three years. So 17 total thus far. Now we add those that are currently in the queue or are in process. And those are the ones in gray on the bottom here. And so we still have four more retailers uh, in process, uh, along with two manufacturers and one delivery. Uh, what that does is, is that now moves are, if all of those are approved, that now moves us up to having 14 cannabis retailers in the city of uh, Port Wyneme uh, with a majority sitting on that green mile stretch. Uh, that now also accounts for now seven delivery services, four cultivators, and as you can see by the uh, tally number on the left, uh, that would bring us to 24 total cannabis businesses operating in the city of Port Wyneme. So if I give you a map of that, that's what this looks like with the yellow representing retail, the blue representing delivery, and the orange representing manufacturing and delivery. So 
You can see the concentration of cannabis businesses, especially in the north end along the Channel Islands corridor. So let's talk about sales and what cannabis has done for this city over the last three years. This slide was taken from my presentation in March of 2018. Um, I'm sorry, March of 2019. So the, that calendar year in 2018, we made $11 million in gross cannabis sales. In that March, I estimated the rest of 2019 to bring in 25 million. And then I estimated 2020 to be at $35 million. So I grossly miss or underestimated uh, what cannabis was gonna be doing for us. So as you can see in 2019, that number was not 25 million as I forecasted. It was actually $36 million. And then for 2020, uh, our number is going to be closer to uh, $45 million uh, for this year. And so you can kind of see uh, the trend as dispensaries open up, uh, there appears to be um, more sales uh, coming in. So this is what it looks like um, through December of 2019, uh, with the top month being $3.7 million. And we thought perhaps that we had plateaued, and this is what we were going to start seeing on a regular basis now. Um, that could be further from the truth. So May of 2020, with the six cannabis dispensaries open here that are listed, um, we capped out at 4.5 million in May of 2020. So despite more dispensaries opening up, um, sales are continuing uh, to increase. You don't see them plateauing or tapering off. And then uh, July, which has been our highest month on record, uh, we brought in nearly $5 million in cannabis sales amongst our seven dispensaries in operation. So if we take that $5 million a month, multiply it by 12, that gives us $60 million. If we were to stay right at that consistent $5 million a month rate, when you multiply that by 5%, that's $3 million of projected or forecasted income to the city. And then you add the sales tax of the 70, um, the uh, three quarters of a percent that comes to the city uh, and that uh, drives it up to a $4.5 million. So that's where we're at there. So a lot of people ask with all these customers coming in and all this money coming in, what does that do to traffic? And, and what are we looking at right now? So when we first started in 2018 or um, for that complete year through 2019, we were bringing in 1,150 customers per day that's about 35,000 customers per month. And to present day, uh, we're now doing 2,200 customers per day, which equates to 66,000 customers coming to Port Wainimi per month to purchase cannabis. Now, also the natural question to that is, uh, have, has the increase in traffic created any type of, or made any type of environmental impacts uh, to our city, such as traffic, or crime, um, uh, DUI related uh, cannabis uh, driving, and it, it has not. Uh, crime has stayed stagnant or idle, I should say, or actually decreased. Um, we have not seen an increase in traffic collisions, especially along the Channel Islands corridor. And uh, we have yet to date to have a, what we would call um, driving under the influence of drugs or cannabis uh, in our city since the first dispensary opened. We've had quite a few alcohol related, but not cannabis related. So this gives you a much, uh, this gives you a more specific breakdown of where we were at in March of 2019, um, then September of 2019, and now a year later in terms of customer growth, with the busiest days being on Friday, uh, where we bring in nearly 3,000 customers a week on Fridays. And I've also been told that the first day of the month as well as the 15th day of the month uh, are also very busy days regardless of what day uh, they actually fall on. 
So where are all these cannabis customers coming from? Our population is only 24,000 people. Um, if we did the math, that's nearly two and a half times our city population are coming to the city of Port Wyneme to purchase cannabis. These are figures drawn from uh, cannabis sales. 42% of the customers come from the city of Oxnard, 19% from Ventura, 10% from Port Wyneme. One of the things I'd like to point out to you here is 13% of our customers come from out of state. And there's the breakdown from out of state from uh, as far as Arizona, Texas, and Florida. And I'm gonna show you a map here of that breakdown. And many of you may ask, how do I know this information or how do I get this information? When you go into any one of our dispensaries, you have to show and present a valid driver's license or valid identification card, which then gets logged into their system. So we're able to track where all these customers are coming from. And what this map really denotes is that they're not just coming from Ventura County, they're coming from all over the United States, all over California, even states that currently have cannabis laws passed, such as Colorado. And so we, in my opinion, have become a destination. Uh, so when people come to visit Ventura County or Los Angeles, they come to Port Wyneme to purchase a product. One of the big misnomers too is that this is a young person's thing. And our statistics show that 40% of all the customers that visit our cannabis dispensaries are over the age of 40 years old. And I love showing this picture here of this 90 year old um, female who's there with her caretaker uh, to purchase medicinal cannabis. So contributions, I talked about our community contribution program and that 1%. This is the breakdown of, of what I've been able to collect thus far and the donations that our dispensaries have made. Um, over $865,000 thus far have been donated or pledged by our dispensaries thus far with over half a million being pledged to our Boys and Girls Club over the next uh, five years. And so that they are doing their part. They are committing themselves to the community as they promised. And so here I wanted you to show uh, the breakdown with, as you can see, our, our stronger dispensaries are, are definitely donating uh, to our community and all of these different programs here on the right with the most recent donations being um, committed to movies in the park and the movie screens, as well as the homeless care packages that are going to be delivered at, this, at the end of this month. So this is just a brief summary. Uh, so, so far in 2020, uh, we will have received nearly $2.5 million from cannabis sales. Um, community contributions have totaled over the next, over the last three years to $869,000. And as I stated earlier, uh, we have 251 jobs we have created. Um, and 35 inside of our community. And another misnomer is people actually think that these are minimum wage paying jobs and they're actually not. They, most dispensaries pay at least $18 an hour and that equates to about $38,000 a year. And that's just for the line level. So let's talk about the numbers. Uh, 2018 and 2019, those are the hard numbers that we've received. Um, 2020, while we haven't received all of our deposits yet from our dispensaries to close everything out, uh, we are forecasting nearly $50 million in gross sales, which gives us a three year total of nearly $100 million uh, since we opened up our dispensaries um, three years ago. Uh, that equates to $4.86 million to our city uh, in revenue. And then we talk about the 1% community contributions, uh, which equates to nearly a million dollars in contributions uh, to our community. So what does it look like for the next three years? If our neighboring cities were not coming online with cannabis, this is what I would be forecasting right now over the next three years. And it is held pretty true um, given the model that we now have to, to use um, here. Um, but unfortunately with Ventura and Oxnard coming online, uh, I've had to amend this chart and so I have reduced uh, the numbers in 2022 as well as 2023. 
uh, because I expect Oxnard retail cannabis to be online by mid 2022, uh, as well as the city of Ventura. So that slightly lowered our numbers to a three year total of $156 million, but that is still um, over a three year period, $7.8 million. Uh, again, that is being forecasted and projected that is being brought into uh, the city. Uh, and then you can see there, um, how the 1% community contributions are also going to be applied and uh, money that we can expect uh, to be donated uh, to our community organizations. So impacts from our neighboring cities, the city of Oxnard especially. Um, originally, they were going to be opening up eight retail dispensaries. That changed approximately a month ago. Uh, they will now be opening up 16 retail dispensaries that they will be approving. Uh, they just reinitiated another process uh, to add eight additional, uh, and they've already completed a process for eight manufacturing distribution locations in their city for a total of 24 cannabis businesses. The city of Ventura, uh, their council, is, this is, is going to be before council in the coming months, but they are looking at adding anywhere from two to five retail dispensaries and two to five manufacturing distribution locations. Uh, within their jurisdiction. So all of these additional dispensaries are going to have an impact in the city of Port Wainimi. But what I would like to point out, and it is a, a very important thing, is that over these first three years, we've been able to create a brand, a loyalty of customers uh, that come to Port Wainimi. And as many of us do, we have our favorite restaurants, our favorite uh, hairstyling salons, our, our favorite eateries, and you will drive the extra 10 or 15 minutes to get to the location that you become accustomed to, uh, to their service and to the products they have. So we have that head start um, on these other cities. And so I don't foresee us losing a great deal of customers when these cities open up. Uh, I expect a 20 to 25% drop in sales I also expect us to recover from that slide because cannabis is going to start to normalize and your everyday citizen, well, just like it is now, is going to be um, feel a lot better about visiting these locations to, to purchase a cannabis. That stigma is going to be uh, released and uh, people, you're going to see more everyday people inside of our dispensaries uh, purchasing uh, cannabis. What also makes us a very favorable city and location, and I've even included Oxnard's numbers in this table, is as you can see, uh, our cannabis tax rate through our development agreements is only 5%. When you add our current tax rate, it's 8.75. <coughs> and across the board there is we charge 28.75% for every dollar, which equates to $128 uh, for every hundred dollars you spend, excuse me. <clears throat> so we are, our rates are lower here and people will travel to go somewhere where their the rates are lower. Um, Oxnard is going to be actually charging a dollar fifty more for every hundred dollars spent in their city than what we currently spent as they're, they just passed a one and a half sent sales tax so their tax rate is higher plus they're charging their cannabis dispensaries at six percent whereby we only charge five percent so let's get to it in terms of one of the big reasons why we're here and that's the excessive concentration of cannabis businesses in our city when council when this was brought before council uh almost four years ago or three plus years ago, it was thought that we didn't have very many locations to have cannabis, that the market would correct itself, and um, this wouldn't occur. And what we didn't expect to happen is uh, these cannabis businesses were buying entire buildings. Uh, and several of our cannabis dispensaries have actually, as you know, bought large buildings. On top of that, they have welcomed in other retailers within those buildings. And so them not worried about the competition, they've then brought in more retailers. 
And so that's kind of why we've reached the point uh, to where we're at right now with potentially having 14 retailers in the city of Port Wainimi because we don't have a number that strictly regulates how many dispensaries we can have in our city like Oxnard has done and where they've said we're only going to accept 16 retailers in our city. So if we use a definition as subscribed by the Bureau of Cannabis Control is we are uh, oversaturated or have an excessive concentration of cannabis dispensaries in our city. Uh, the Bureau of Cannabis C Control places that onus on the city to regulate that. Um, and so they merely describe uh, what excessive concentration is. So a city can use that to deny licenses or use that as a model to decide whether or not um, they've reached their limit or if they should pursue any additional applications. So if we use our current ratios right now, uh, the ratios of licenses to population in Ventura County is 2% for every 1,000. The ratio of licenses to population in Port Wainimi is nearly half a percent or six tenths of a percent per 1,000 or approximately 30 times higher. Now, if we consider just our two census tracts where our licenses are permitted, that ratio actually increases to uh, almost, um, that would be eight tenths of a percent per 1,000 or approximately 42 times higher. So I wanted to break this down even more for everyone. So with our population of 24,000 residents with 14 dispensaries, that's one dispensary for every 1,700 residents. If Oxnard approved all 16 dispensaries with their population, that would only be one dispensary for every 14,000 residents. In Ventura, there are two dispensaries. That would be one dispensary for every 55,000 residents. Uh, Bakersfield, just to grab another city, they have five dispensaries for 400,000 residents. So that's one dispensary for every 80,000 residents. Oakland has one dispensary for every 25,000 residents. And even San Diego has one dispensary for every 35,000 residents. So we, we are really high right now in terms of concentration. Uh, due to that, I actually have self-anointed us the cannabis capital of the world because we have such a high concentration of cannabis dispensaries in the city of Port Wainimi. So moving on, I wanted to kind of close this out real quick and let everyone know what we're doing here that makes us so special. Uh, aside from a lot of the other cities. Um, one, um, just because you have a cannabis business license here uh, doesn't mean you automatically get your license renewal. Uh, we do audits every year and uh, we review all of our cannabis dispensaries. So their annual license is not automatic and we review everyone. Um, we have a responsible cannabis server certification training program here. No one else is doing that. In fact, I'll show you the slide there. This is our opening slide for the program that we have where we train every single cannabis employee here in the city of Port Wainimi, and we call that RCS training. There is no one else doing that. It is a four hour training that we require all cannabis uh, employees to go through, uh, just like ABC does for those that are serving alcohol. Uh, we have cannabis educational forums. Um, many of the council here in this meeting, had, uh, we're at the original educational forum that was sold out at the community center in March of 2019. And we regularly provide uh, these forums uh, for the community. Uh, we haven't been able to do that much in 2020, but as soon as things open back up, these will continue. Uh, we talked about our security recommendations and our development agreements. Uh, we have private meetings with our owners every time they make their deposits here at the city so we can exchange information. We talked about our community contribution program. We talked about live scanning all of our employees and our identification card program. Um, we've been doing undercover minor decoy operations. Uh, we hold mandatory meetings with our owners and managers twice a year. Uh, the council approved a social host ordinance that involves cannabis. And that's something that we have now uh, implemented and enforced here in the city of Port Wainimi. And we require all of our dispensaries to have mandatory literature 
in all of their retail storefronts. As you can see right here on the right-hand side, we've teamed up with Ventura County Behavioral Health as well as the Office of uh, Traffic Safety uh, to produce uh, this educational uh, material. So what I'm looking for here or would like the discussion to uh, talk about is um, where we're gonna go moving forward. Um, do we allow more retail dispensaries to open up in the city of Port Wainini? Um, do we not make any changes at all? Do we put a moratorium uh, for the next couple of years uh, on cannabis dispensaries and no longer accept any additional applications moving forward for the time being. So we can reset based on what's happening in our neighboring communities. Do we amend the city ordinance? And then something I wanted to talk about briefly is uh, cannabis staffing. Before we opened up our first retail dispensary, I came before council in December of 2017 and requested a, an additional officer and additional records technician to address the increase in cannabis enforcement and regulation. Uh, at that time, council said that uh, they would not approve because we didn't know how much money was gonna be coming in at the time and it was putting the cart before the horse uh, in regards to uh, what that revenue was gonna look like. And so they did not wanna commit to any uh, positions. Uh, the, the next month they agreed to add uh, a records technician and that is the records technician that now processes all of the cannabis backgrounds and does all the life scans and has brought in all the additional revenue. Uh, but I would like council to consider and um, adding the law enforcement officer whose role will be to enforce and regulate not only cannabis, but tobacco and alcohol in our community. And we would make that a hybrid position, which would be, uh, which would also include uh, the homeless liaison officer, because we don't have enough homeless to really substantiate a full-time police officer position to address the homeless issue in our community. We would tie all of this together uh, to actually staff a full-time law enforcement officer um, and meet the needs of our community. So with that, um, I am done. I hope that didn't take too long. Um, and I will take any questions. I was gonna allow Charles or Laura to facilitate the questions um, if, or if there's just open discussion about any or all of this, um, so be it. So I'm here, I'm here to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Chief. Really appreciate the thoroughness of your presentation. <clears throat> Are there any questions from our fellow council members? Council member Hernandez, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Gama, and thank you, um, Chief Salinas for that um, really informative presentation. I actually thought we had less number of dispensaries. 14 came to mind as a possible cap. Um, my question has to do with um, how you calculated our competition with Oxnard and Ventura. What did you actually look at? Did you look at the, uh, did you estimate the number of customers and calculate it based on those numbers? But how did you really arrive at your forecast without sure. going into too much detail? Uh, absolutely, so it, it's more anecdotal based on what I have seen over the last three years in terms of the increase in customers coming to our dispensaries. Uh, the populations uh, in Oxnard, where our customers are coming from, um, how many dispensaries we currently have, how many of the, those cities uh, plan to open. And so I, I came up with this assessment. Um, there is, I don't have any statistical formula uh, for this. Um, and it was just pretty much my best forecast as to how we were gonna be impacted by these two communities opening cannabis in mid 2022. Okay, thank you. How long do you think it'll be before Oxenter's uh, uh, stores actually are operational? Uh, operational. So uh, Oxnard just restarted their process again for retail. So that I think bought us another six months. Um, I expect them to be online in mid 2022. 
uh, and not really fully operational till the beginning of 2023, where we start to feel the impact of customers starting to go uh, to Oxnard for the simple fact that it may be closer for some people um, or maybe off the freeway for some people, or maybe the people in Camarillo don't wanna drive all the way to Wainimi. But as I explained that earlier example, hopefully we've created such a, a brand loyalty here that um, it doesn't impact us too much. Okay, so that could be actually a, a reason we would um, maybe hold off on any kind of moratorium or making any changes um, until we really start to get closer to the time when these other shops are opening? Just something yes, I think we look at, right? Yes, yeah, so my worries there is, uh, let's say we don't put do anything and we allow the 14 to open up, there's still the possibility that additional dispensaries will uh, apply here and that number increases. And then we're competing with the 16 dispensaries and two in Oxnard, you know, between Oxnard and Ventura. So now I have the 20 dispensaries trying to fight for the competition as opposed to having 14 strong, highly regulated uh, cannabis uh, locations in Port Wainimi. You now are going to find people trying to cut corners and, and trying to find that competitive edge because there's so many other competitors uh, that are nearby. So I think the lower we keep that number, um, the more our... Um, the more success we'll bring to our cannabis dispensaries to stay open and they won't be as tremendously impacted by the other cities. So, um, what was my question? Just lost my train of thought. Um, I'll, maybe I'll come back to it. I had one more question on the um, cannabis officer. Um, can you provide a little bit more detail on what the cannabis officer would be doing? Sure, just to kind of give you a bird's eye view, because if, if council gives me that direction, I'll come back with a more formalized a staff report. Um, but uh, the cannabis officer would do all of the um, regulation and enforcement and inspections of the dispensaries. Uh, they would thoroughly review all of the applications. Uh, they would um, participate and assist in any grant applications as they relate to cannabis, um, especially since there's a lot of money out there right now. In fact, we're applying right now with the Boys and Girls Club through Proposition 64 and applying for a million dollar grant um, for cannabis. Um, and on top of that, we don't have a, a tobacco officer or an alcohol compliance officer. So we would tie all of those uh, together. And right now the person doing all of that is me. And oh, no. I, I really need to kind of slide that over to someone else um, because when we started this, we wanted it to get off on the right foot. We wanted it to be successful. And so I played a big part in it. And now I, I need to start detaching myself and training someone else to do uh, oh, these types of, of uh, items. And then it, it dawned on me that, you know, that position isn't necessarily full time. How can we complement it? And right now, um, complementing that with a homeless liaison officer seemed uh, like the right move. Okay. I remembered my other question. Um, so Oxnard and Ventura, um, what, oh God, I just I forgot it again. What about the base population? Do we know that if any of the base population was considered in, so, uh, in your um, estimates? for customers? Yeah. No, because traditionally I would think that the, um, because it's still a federally illegal drug that the base or its military personnel um, do not visit our cannabis dispensaries, um, at least not those enlisted, perhaps the spouses do. Um, but I don't think that has a tremendous impact on um, our customers um, being that the base is right next door. Okay. And how many of our businesses um, that we have here in Port Wainimi are opening up in Oxnard and Ventura? Um, I am only aware of two current Port Wainimi cannabis locations applying in the city of Oxnard. Okay. All right, that, that concludes my questions for now. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Perez, do you have any questions? Member Martinez, do you have any questions for Chief? 
Not yet. Not right now. Thank you, Mayor Connell. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins, where are you at? Is he here? I see that he's disappeared from my screen. Disappeared. Well, I'll jump in and um, <clears throat> it's my understanding that there's 51 applicants in the city of Oxnard for 16 licenses. And have you seen a map of the locations that are under consideration for dispensaries? I have not, but um, I do know that a majority of them are north of Woolly Road. There aren't very many down in the south end, i.e. Saviors Road, uh, Channel Islands. Um, I see a majority of them off of Vineyard Avenue, uh, downtown Oxnard, uh, along those corridors. Yeah, and this is my opinion only, and it might be worth something and it might not be, but I think the advantage that the city of Port Wainimi has is the concentration of the dispensaries in the Green Mile. Um, it appears to me that it's a, it's a safe, it's very safe. It's, it's, um, it, it's in a good area. And I just wonder where, because of the, my understanding is of the 51 applications being submitted, each one of them already have a location. Yes. So how much is it going to play in the decision-making process of, of Oxnard to, to pick the best locations. I mean, you know, cause they say in business location is everything. And so I, I you know, I kind of wonder like um, they might be going too, too fast, too, too quickly. So that, that's a great question. And I do have an answer. Uh, so the first part of your question is uh, excellent statement in regards to uh, that's part of our brand that we are a very safe area to come and purchase your cannabis uh, because not only do we have armed security guards, our crime rate is low, they're in well-established, well-lit shopping centers. And so that's another thing that we have going for us. There are 51, uh, 50 or 51 applications in the auctioner process. The original eight that were approved, I've seen that list. Uh, they were in the north end of Oxnard and downtown Oxnard. And I, I think only one was down in the south end. Uh, so they are not approving these dispensaries based on where they're located, but rather based on the content of their applications. Interesting. Um, has Rollins come back yet? I'm sure he has a question or a comment. Okay. Um, so we don't have any inclination as to where they're going to concentrate their dispensaries. It's pretty much spread out. Uh, the, the original eight um, are in the north end. It, it could be now that with these next eight, uh, they open up or select those that are closer to the south end of Oxnard. Uh, we won't know that probably till mid-year. Okay. Rich will be back on. He had to switch to phone. Okay. Poor guy. Uh, any other questions? Just a question of, of a fact here. Does what is Oxnard's um, tax rate after they, they pass their so they, they uh, passed, one percent or their passed, one cent tax? Uh, they passed a six percent cannabis tax. I'm sorry, a six percent, six percent, and then they right. all and their sales tax, their final sales tax is nine point two five now. They added a cent and a half okay. during this last election. And uh, they are also right. um, charge not charging, but um, their 1% community contributions program as well. Are they being, are they requiring security at their facilities as well, their, yes. their businesses? Yes, they are modeling their security program around ours, which does require an armed security guard at all of their retail locations. Hmm. Um, since this is kind of a, a open workshop, I'd love to hear, or if we can hear from Tony uh, or even Steve Kinney, who may have some, you know, statements or input uh, in, in all of this. Absolutely. Are Tony and Kenny out there? Yeah. Yeah. 
Actually, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I am, but I was just away from, from the screen for a few minutes. So I'd be happy to respond once I know what the question was. <laughs> so I had brought up that since this is an open workshop, that perhaps we should get some additional input from staff, uh, especially Steve Kinney or Tony Stewart in regards to cannabis in Port Wainimi or just some generalized statements from them because they're such a big part of the selection process and really have a good understanding of, of cannabis in Ventura County. Well, Mayor, I'd, I'd be happy to take a minute if, if that's appropriate. Please, please do. Okay, thank you. Mayor, Council, good, good evening. Um, well, he thought it was a great comprehensive um, overview of the chief. Um, I learned several things from it. <clears throat> Just to review the past few years of the history in, in Port Wainimi. Um, I think what, what I would add now is that I've been watching the process going on in Oxnard over the last many months. Um, and it really brings to me the contrast between uh, the process going on there, which, which I view as a much more conventional sort of approach by cities uh, with that that we took here in Wainimi. Um, just the, all the points that, that the chief mentioned as the sort of custom features of the application process, the, the review process, um, the, the interaction between the dispensaries um, and city staff um, is, is really un unique to Port Wainimi and to, it, to its credit. I mean, the, I think the dispensaries here have a sense of being um, number one, appreciated and at the same time of uh, being watched very carefully as to how they conduct their business. Um, so that, I mean, if, if, if we just sort of let them go, go about what they do, I think by now we would have seen some sort of slippage in the community with some you know, miscellaneous crime problems or something else. The fact that there's been virtually no increase in any kind of criminal activity related to dispensaries uh, speaks to the fact that that the owners there understand that they need to toe the line. At the same time, it's not a really punitive environment that that the city um, gives to them. I mean, the, the dispensaries understand that. They have an important role to play in, in the community. And as long as they do their part by adhering to all the regulations, they are going to be supported by and appreciated by, um, by the city and the community at large. And I mean, that's from a business person's perspective, that's a real formula for success in a relationship with the city government. Um, I'm not sure. Oxnard is aware of that dynamic yet. Um, and to me, that gives us yet another bit of competitive advantage uh, for the next at least couple of years um, to, to solidify our base. So that's what I would add to the conversation. Uh, Mr. Kenny, has, um, has <clears throat> the dispensaries in the city of Port Wainimi, have they had any discussions amongst themselves to coalesce around the brand, the Green Mile? Um, I think so uh, some time back, Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm aware of at least a, a year, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, there were some efforts by the dispensaries just among themselves to get together and create a sort of a marketing force um, but that that didn't come to anything. I mean, there were some just internal dynamics that just didn't work out there. Um, since then, I haven't heard of any renewed effort 
Um, but I have to believe that they're all astute business people and the Green Mile is such a marketable uh, concept and phrase and everything else that I have to believe that they would all be uh, happy to and, and willing to participate in you know, some kind of marketing effort along that line. Council Member Hernandez had a question. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Ghana. So I, I was gonna ask a question about branding as well. And uh, I just saw on Harbor, Harbor Boulevard, the safe port billboard that's mentioned in the Green Mile. So I was really glad to see that. But I'm a little concerned that we don't really have our finger on the pulse about what the cannabis businesses are doing to care for these additional shops that are gonna be opening up. Um, what can we do, if anything, to help them with the branding? Shouldn't we be working closer with them, um, attending their meetings and um, maybe even putting some money toward back into helping them brand the Green Mile or brand the fact that we're a safer community, um, that we are uh, a more, uh, I don't say cheaper, but uh, you know, uh, more cost efficient, you know, uh, stores that don't charge as much as what they'll find in others. It just seems that we have a whole list of things that will help address the competition, but um, who is who is putting those together and who's helping the, the businesses um, with their branding, if any, if anybody. Yes, so I, I can answer that. Uh, one, uh, it'd be great if the Chamber of Commerce uh, was around to assist in, in these types of matters. But so I took the matters into my own hand about uh, six to nine months ago, and we purchased the domain name of portwainimicannabis.org, as well as wainimibeachcannabis.org. And we've actually uh, created a website uh, that has all of our dispensaries on there so people know where to find a legal dispensary uh, in Ventura County and what sets us apart from all the other dispensaries. Just like you said, uh, we're a safe uh, community and this is why you should come here. Uh, that website is actually gonna be launched here in the next few weeks uh, that was created by our PIO uh, and we've already linked with uh, all of our dispensaries. So you can go on there, see a map click on the map and, and go to the dispensary and see what they're all about, as well as promoting, you know, all the things that we do as a city that makes, that sets us apart from everyone else. Okay. Thank you. So the website I think is a great idea, but how do we push that information out and not rely on people having to log into our website to see that? Right. And so my job as a police chief is to make my community safer. And, uh, and I can do that uh, by making sure that those that are wanting to purchase cannabis go to legal and safe locations because uh, they have armed security. Their your cannabis product has been tested. Oh, I'm really working here. Um, has been tested and is labeled uh, and their money is going to a community organization. So um, that's the way we kind of brand ourselves. And not only do we use our own social media accounts, uh, but we use the dispensaries themselves uh, to put out this information. Okay. Yeah, I had this uh, um, this vision of having, you know, like Santa Monica Pier has the, that arch over the entrance to the pier. I think it'd be kind of nice to have, I don't know if we can do a whole arch or if the if the cannabis coalition or whatever they're called would be interested in financing that, but having some kind of um, signage at the entrance to our city limits to, to talk about the kinds of businesses that we have here, not just cannabis, but and of course, cannabis would be foremost, but um, something like welcome to the green mile or. You are now uh, entering the green mile. You know, mm -hmm. You're now entering the green mm -hmm. mile, something mm -hmm. to that effect. Absolutely. Are there any, any other questions or comments for either Mr. Kenny or Chief Salinas? Uh, I just got on by phone. Can anybody hear me? We can all hear you, Mr. Ro uh, Mayor Pro Tram Rollins. 
Very good. Um, uh, I've been out for a few minutes, so many of these questions maybe they've been answered. Um, um, have there been any businesses that have failed to this point? No, uh, no business has been has failed or shut down um, that we have since approved for retail cannabis operation. Uh, we do have one that's operating uh, in the red or having a difficult time, uh, but that is more a result of their current business model than it is uh, as a result of additional cannabis dispensaries opening up. So my second question, each time that a new cannabis business gets presented to the council, um, I know the uh, revenue projections are always quite positive. And when I've asked the question in the past about why they were so positive with you know, all the competition that was out there existing, um, staff has told me that uh, in fact, all of the various different existing cannabis uh, businesses have not only met what they originally predicted, but have exceeded that. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and I know Steve can answer more to this question, but uh, I am certain that all of them have easily exceeded their three-year performa or five-year, well, three-year performa because we're getting into year number three. Uh, and so uh, we could not have expected, and I don't think they could have expected uh, the amount of revenue and the amount of customers uh, that have been generated here in the city of Port Wainimi. Uh, so a follow-up question, just to start up a cannabis business in Port Wainimi, um, it's my understanding it takes quite a big investment uh, do you have any round figures as to what it costs to kind of get up not only with like city fees, but also, um, you know, re um, leasing buildings, heaven forbid buying buildings, but at least leasing buildings for that? Yes. Uh, so it's approximately $30,000 in uh, fees, deposits uh, with the city. Then you're looking at another $225,000 uh, for your build out and actually bringing in inventory uh, for your business. So you're looking at uh, nearly a quarter million dollars uh, in, in cash or um, collateral that you need uh, in order to get your cannabis business uh, started here uh, in Port Wainimi. I don't know if Steve has anything to add to that or if that's relatively accurate. Um, no, that that is right, Chief. But um, um, I'm glad you made the point because that's a that's a big part of the evaluation process in the application. Um, because we asked the applicants um, to do two things: number one, tell us what their startup costs are going to be, and and that includes not just the items that the chief just mentioned, but also uh, simple operating costs for the first three months of their business. Um, so when you put all that together, I mean, it very often is close closer to a half million dollars of what we label startup costs. And the second aspect of that is that we ask the applicants to uh, document to us uh, the fact that they've got that half million dollars available to them so that they can survive the startup period and get into their real revenue production. Um, but I mean, the last thing we, we want is give a license and then have somebody not be able to pay their contractor to finish the tenant improvements and you know, just be a total disaster. So the, the first safeguard is to ensure that they've got the cash to, to launch the business successfully. I would like to add that <clears throat> take all that into consideration and it's $250,000 less than it's gonna to cost to open up in Oxnard. Um, it's my understanding that Oxnard's um, making- Oh, right. Yeah. Whoever yes. they choose, whoever yeah. they give a license to, to pay $250,000 on top of it, so. Mm -hmm. um, right, for the, for the privilege of doing business. Mm -hmm. Right, so yeah. it, it, it appears that 
we have a strategic and competitive advantage um, and that um, it'll be difficult, much more difficult for those dispensaries in Oxnard to get a, a handle on market share than it, than it is here in Port Wainimi. So um, I think we're probably in the best possible position that we could be in. Uh, Mary Gama, I just that Mary Gama, I just had two other comments. I'm sorry. Sorry, Pro Tem. Uh, when without seeing you, you we forget about you. <laughs> sorry. I, I, Go ahead. I'm easily forgotten. I guess. <laughs> um, and anyway, uh, so I guess my point, I guess, was that first of all, uh, to enter into a cannabis business in Port Wainimi is no undertaking, financial undertaking that anyone would take very lightly. Am I correct? Correct. You can't just come up with this idea in your garage one day and be operating the next. It, it, it takes uh, okay. quite a bit of time and money. And then I guess, and, and this may be more of a community and economic development. Um, I have two, cons two kind of thoughts on it. First of all, are there many uh, retail outlets left on the um, uh, Green Mile that cannabis operations could uh, rent right now? Are there are there key are there key areas along that? I mean, it seems like there's a fairly big saturation right now. Are there are there more opportunities right now for any new cannabis operations to lease facilities that are available that would meet kind of those needs that it would take? Well, I, I couldn't say um, positively because the real estate market is always dynamic, but basically it's all tied up right now. All, all the sites that you would normally expect to be appealing to a cannabis dispensary operator um, are, are already in use. Um, it would it would be um, unexpected to find yet another site along the Green Mile. Okay, and then I guess my final statement might be that um, I know we're in a precarious position as far as like generating uh, big box stores or uh, a more diverse economy like within our uh, our city so that we don't have to depend on one source to you know generate the money to make us operate um, uh, on a side note are I mean are there any um, are there any uh, well how would I say it uh, are there any goals right now to diversify our economy I know like I look at a number of the different um, retail outlets, within uh, our community that, you know, have, uh, are, are for lease uh, that, you know, perhaps could be used for other types of things to meet the needs of the community, i.e. Uh, grocery stores, um, auto body shops, auto repair shops, those types of things. And I, my one concern is that we, I don't want to become like the, the Detroit, where you kind of live and die by the car industry, and when the car industry goes down, so does, or in our case, the cannabis industry goes down, so does Wainimi. And uh, not that it's, I just, that's my one concern right now. That, that certainly opens up um, you know, a much broader discussion, um, Mayor Pro Tem, but I think the for this discussion tonight, the one thing I would say is that um, cannabis businesses can be used as a vehicle to support uh, a number of other types of retail businesses. I mean, they, they are the magnets that bring people into the community. Once they're here, they don't necessarily have to turn around and leave town before you know, stopping by a restaurant or another kind of retail outlet. So I, th I think if we look at uh, the cannabis guys as as one of our sort of marketing leaders, 
to bring people into the community, then that beneficial effect spreads more broadly. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and to add to that, one of the, the best things the city did is they took a two-pronged approach to dealing with their uh, budget deficit and in creating revenue, not only did they bring cannabis on board, but we passed a one cent sales tax, which really kind of acts as a buffer uh, just in case our cannabis program really decides to take a dive uh, thanks to our neighboring cities uh, bringing cannabis on board. If I may, I, I think um, moving forward, and I don't know how we would accomplish this, but it seems that we need to support the businesses that believed in the city of Port Wyneme and came on with us three years ago. And, um, you know, do we just stop accepting applications or how do we go about if we were to decide that, okay, so um, we're going to uh, halt any more licensees. Um, clearly the city of Oxnard at first said they're gonna do eight and now they're up to 16. We're up to 14, I think. And uh, so what would we do? Like people could submit applications all day long and we could um, review them and then bring them forward. But at some point in time, the saturation level is is hit. Um, so I'm a little unclear as to where do we, what's our next step? Do we, do we uh, have a conversation about um, not accepting any more applications for dispensaries or do we come up with a number, the number that we already have? Or I know that we don't have an action item tonight, but um, where are we going from here after this workshop tonight is my question. Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, that's a, I, I love the point in regards to Oxnard's application process. I do uh, see that if someone doesn't get, doesn't, if someone doesn't get approved in Oxnard, they're going to start applying in Port Wyneme. Uh, and so that's a, another concern of mine is that we should consider trying to put a cap or a moratorium because what we're going to do is now see this influx of all these people that didn't qualify in Oxnard. They're going to start sliding our way and, and kind of exacerbating the problem. So it's just something to consider. And I, I would love to hear from everyone in terms of just general direction or their feelings about um, where they would like to see us moving forward to kind of give staff um, a more, um, you know, a specific area to kind of focus on and then come back to, to council. Council member Martinez. Well, I do feel like we might have a good amount of dispensaries already in our city considering, um, you know, how many dispensaries we have per people here in our city, which is ridiculously um, high compared to the whole state. Um, that at least that's kind of how I feel. Just just so you guys know, and also, um, I was just wondering how would that if we do put a cap, how, is that going to affect? Then I mean, we would just not allow it to affect any of the existing applications, correct? Cor correct, yes. Uh, we would no longer allow any further applications to be submitted. All of the ones that are currently in the pipeline would be processed and um, be brought before council for approval if they got that far. All right, thank you. And, and on that, I would just add that, you know, you talked about staff time and we certainly don't want to be wasting staff time. And if, um, if uh, if we're not going to approve a new applicant, then why would we want staff wasting all this time in doing all the things they have to do to bring them to us? And then, you know, I think we owe it to uh, not only our our Green Mile and Emerald perspective and Red Mule and everyone else that's been approved and in the pipeline. Um, I think. I think we, you know, we have a little bit of loyalty to them too, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to um, have staff wasting time on on um, applications that are going to go nowhere. Councilmember Perez. So I would definitely be in favor of cap, and I know that many of the dispensaries that we have now are definitely in favor 
of a cap. And they've also said one way we could we could help um, with that issue is by generating continued generation of interest. They're mentioning farmers markets, regular events, um, lounges, and other things that have happened down in West Hollywood that are a big hit and have kept people and, and also marketing signage, um, which Laura mentioned, that would keep generating the appeal for people to come into our area without having the um, over use of it. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins is back. I think he's still, you're muted though. Council Member Hernandez. Thank you, Mayor Goma. Um, Chief, the saturation ratio, that's um, formula set up by the state, is that correct? Correct, it's specifically delineated in the Bureau of Cannabis Control Regulations as it relates to cannabis. Okay, so how do they view our ratio as it stands right now? Do we get warnings or do we get advisories saying that, you know, watch out, you're getting too high? No, they, they expect the cities I mean, to kind high of- High in numbers, not high, high, you know. Not their cannabis. expectation right now is the city uh, is gonna regulate their, their cannabis industry. You know, they've given that uh, discretion to the city. Uh, th those numbers they delineate in the Bureau of Cannabis Control is to kind of give the, the city guidance um, in terms of uh, how many or, or what's a, an excessive concentration because they know that, you know, these cities are gonna be flooded with all of these applications. So it just kind of gives you some sort of guide. Uh, I don't foresee the state coming down and saying, you have too many cannabis dispensaries, you need to shut five of them. Um, I don't foresee that happening, uh, but we should definitely start trying to limit, uh, you know, what we have now. Yeah, I'm, um, I would not put all our eggs in one basket in terms of focusing on that ratio, because we're kind of, this is kind of our niche, right? The cannabis business is here in Wainimi, being the, one of the first cities to actually um, approve an ordinance and establish a process for applicants and, and establishing businesses has, have, has we've done. Um, I think there's other considerations that we need to look at other than that one number has a guiding factor in whether or not we uh, put a cap on the number of businesses we have. I think we have to, we have to consider that. I mean, I, I do believe we've got to stop yeah. somewhere, but not let's not let that ratio be our, our, our main reason for doing that. Yeah, I always try to draw a parallel with the sales of alcohol <clears throat> and um, and it, uh, it really opens up a lot of uh, imagination because if you think about it, how many places can you get a beer or alcohol in and around the city of Port Wainimi. And um, it's probably too many locations to count. And the same goes with the city of Oxnard. So if cannabis is gonna follow, I don't know if it's accurate to say this, but you know, you could get alcohol everywhere um, and you can't get cannabis everywhere. So perhaps there is more room than we suspect for the continuation of of our industry sales numbers. And, and I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see and see how it works out. Um, uh, I agree. Go ahead. I agree with that statement, uh, but just keep in mind with additional businesses, we should really uh, have the staffing or enforcement and regu regulation in place to address having that many businesses uh, here so they, it doesn't get away from us. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins. Uh, my, my one concern is um, a, a complete um, uh, uh, denial of any business, any cannabis business coming in. If a new cannabis business comes in that has a unique model that none of the other cannabis operations have had, up to this point, and we have a, a blank denial because we've got a moratorium on it, I'm concerned whether or not we're putting ourselves into a box. Um, at the same time, uh, 
if there's just another kind of like um, uh, basic cannabis operation that, you know, we have 14 others, uh, you know, maybe we can show some restraint on adding an, another one. But, you know, I mean, there, there's, uh, yeah, I've heard all different types of models that are coming in that might become creative that, you know, may send, it's like a restaurant or anything else. You have, we have loads of restaurants, but a new restaurant co that comes in that has a unique model or unique um, crowd, if we just say blank, we're going to not allow any new restaurants in, we lose that opportunity. And so I'm just a little bit concerned about that. Yeah, this is only focused on retail and uh, not cannabis dispensaries as a, as a blanket. So we would still accept applications for restaurants uh, with cannabis infused food, lounges, uh, manufacturing distribution. Uh, just our focus right now would be retail. That's good to know. Yeah, which, which, which might be really good because if we're kind of embracing the cannabis industry, we have a multifaceted ability to, to provide for the general public. You can retail it, you can go to a, a local lounge, I'm not saying that we're going to do that, but like you'd have various different types of opportunities that you could embrace and uh, which would, again, help the whole Wainimi brand, perhaps, mm -hmm. again, depending on what's you know, presented to us in the future. That's it. Council Member Hernandez. Yes. You know, I, I think what we're doing here or, or should be doing this like a SWOT analysis on the moratorium. You know, what are the, the threats of doing, um, having a moratorium? What are the weaknesses, the opportunities, um, the strengths um, that come to the city as a result of establishing a moratorium? Um, not even looking at what it might look like um, or, or what the specifics of the moratorium. But I think based on our discussion, if the city manager is thinking along these terms of a SWOT analysis, if we could um, have staff come back uh, with what has been garnered here through our discussion, I think analysis, it might help us to um, a decision as to how we establish or if we establish a moratorium. I think that's a very good suggestion. Mr. City Manager, what do you think about that? Uh, thank you, Councilmember Hernandez. I would have to say Hello. A, a brilliant recommendation. <laughs> um, and I, I can, um, I have some tools that I can quickly uh, 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 create a, different, a couple different scenarios and do a, a full SWOT uh, a workup for that. There are some uh, major assumptions. I, I do warn uh, though, uh, with in, with regard to you know uh, projected revenue and impacts of uh, adjacent uh, municipalities um, um, operating cannabis too. So um, you know keep in mind these things are all um, our, our projections and estimates with not a whole lot of good uh, comparative market data and analysis uh, to lean on. So um, there, there there is a little bit of risk in, in, in making some of these assumptions. Okay. Any, is that something the council is interested in? Is that, is it, what do the rest of you think about that? I think that staff has more than enough information to uh, come back to us with um, some alternatives to consider. Um, and I think, um, I think, uh, I think we should uh, look forward to that. I think the more information we have, then the better prepared that we can make the decision. Any other Will we be coming back in a public workshop like this again? Or how will we have an opportunity to, to look at this SWOT analysis once it's finally uh, scoped out? I think since we've narrowed down the subject matter a little bit, uh, we can uh, easily come back with a staff report uh, presentation uh, specifically focused on the SWOT analysis and then give a council options uh, following that presentation to uh, make a decision or not. Yeah, it might be um, 
three alternatives, do nothing, do something, or do a little bit in between. Yes. <laughs> Along those lines. Right. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> okay. But I, I think it'll be really interesting to see where our strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats lie. I think if we can see that um, in a SWOT format, that will help us get closer to a decision. Uh, for me, that's just the way I kind of operate. Absolutely. And I've got some brilliant minds here to help me with that. Yeah. I guess, I mean, if you want more direction right now, I would say, yes, we need a cap. What does the cap look like? I don't, I'm not sure what that's, what it should look like. Um, but uh, what can we do if we do have a cap? What's it going to look like? What's going to go along with that? What can we do to invest more into our businesses that currently exist here um, so that we we can meet the competition, that we can maintain a competitive edge against the other stores that are opening. Um, so I, I think it'll be helpful. Okay. I think it'll help be helpful for us to kind of come to that, that point. Are there any other comments or questions before we close this workshop out? Okay. Um, so I guess this will conclude our workshop on the cannabis um, alternatives. And are there any other last comments or questions before we close this out? Okay, well, thank you very much, Chief, for a very thorough report. We're now going to move to the community workshop consideration and of additional smoking restrictions. And I see Charles is getting ready to come on board. We see your screen. Perfect. Are you ready to go, sir? Yes, I am. Good evening, everybody. Uh, for the record, Charles Parrott, Deputy City Manager. So uh, this portion of our workshop tonight uh, provides members of the public and the city council to share thoughts on potential changes to smoking regulations in the city. Uh, as many of you will recall during city council's consideration of smoking and tobacco related ordinances last year, uh, there were some thoughts that were expressed about expanding smoking prohibitions in the city. Uh, there were some comments that were specific to uh, prohibiting smoking in parks, but there were other comments that were more general in nature, seeking a comprehensive review of the city council, uh, of the city's smoking regulations. Uh, in order to move forward with drafting a new or an amended ordinance, staff needs a clear understanding of what the council wishes to achieve uh, if there is a desire to amend the code. Setting this foundation will allow staff to identify and propose appropriate prohibitions, create a legally defensible ordinance, and locate it within the proper section of the code. So uh, Port Wanini has three smoking and tobacco related ordinances that govern the sale and the use of cigarettes, cigars, pipes, electronic smoking devices, and other lighted or heated tobacco products. The oldest ordinance uh, Ordinance 550 pertains to general smoking regulations and it was adopted in 1989. Since that time, there have not been any substantive changes to that ordinance. Uh, it was included in the packet, but by way of very brief review, the ordinance primarily pertains to prohibitions of smoking in enclosed spaces. Uh, Ordinance 761 was adopted by the city February of last year, and that established tobacco and electronic cigarette license requirements for retailers. Um, and then the, the third item listed here, Ordinance 773 was adopted last September, and that established prohibitions against smoking and vaping at the beach, wharf, and pier. Uh, we've received public comments during discussion of these items, uh, and they primarily pertain to two areas, uh, which is also consistent with the three public comments that we received tonight. Uh, and they are the proposed, uh, a proposal for a ban on the sale of flavored tobacco products and a proposal to ban smoking in multi-unit housing developments. Uh, I should note that the state last year uh, 
passed uh, SB 793, uh, which was a statewide ban on the sale of flavored tobacco products. It was to go into effect January 1st of this year. Uh, that was put on hold. There was an effort, a petition signed by uh, a number of California residents uh, to seek um, uh, delay of the implementation of that law and consideration of a ballot measure uh, to consider whether or not the ban of flavored tobacco products should become law in our state. So uh, as part of staff's research on this subject, uh, smoking ordinances for six Ventura County cities and the county, the unincorporated areas of the city were reviewed. In most cases, organizations locate uh, smoking ordinances in public health, uh, public health and safety, public health and sanitation sections of their codes. Uh, I did find that there are significant differences from city to city uh, as it pertains to the specific prohibitions, but some common prohibitions that were found among the cities that I took a look at, there are prohibitions commonly in recreational areas such as parks and gardens and open spaces. Uh, there are often prohibitions against smoking in outdoor dining areas and public events, property that is owned or leased by the city. Um, also areas proximate, they varied in distance, but proximate to entrances, uh, buildings that are accessed by the public. And then there are a number that do prohibit smoking in multi-unit housing areas. So another item uh, that I believe the council is aware of, it was part of discussion uh, last year uh, is the American Lung Association's uh, report card, their state of tobacco control. Uh, and in 2020, the report card that came out graded Port Wyneme uh, as an F. That report card is issued at the beginning of the calendar year, and it did not include the actions that the council took during 2020. So I did communicate with representatives from the American Lung Association, made sure that they had information about the actions taken. Uh, and I can confirm that the report that should be coming out later this month will provide a grade for our city of C. Uh, so we've enhanced our grade by the actions that this council took in 2020. Um, while C is certainly not an A, uh, you'll note uh, of the 10 cities and the uh, unincorporated areas, uh, the grades are, are primarily Ds and Fs. Uh, there's one B uh, and then there are three Cs. We will, as I said, uh, join the category of, of C. Um, uh, so that's where we stand with regard to the American Lung Association's uh, report card. So uh, this is brief. Uh, and the reason it's brief is because the primary purpose tonight is to establish whether or not there is interest from the council in modifying our smoking regulations. If the answer is yes, staff really wants to understand and articulate what the council's intent, what is the purpose of amending. Uh, from that, we would be able to go back, do work uh, to propose a revised ordinance or a new ordinance that would identify prohibitions that would be relevant to the intent that is established. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, this will allow for a legally defensible law uh, in the city. Uh, as with all ordinance amendments, uh, the next steps would include a public hearing where the members of the public and the council would have the opportunity to review and comment on what is proposed. And that would be followed by a second reading. Uh, and if both of those were supported, uh, that would lead to the approval and eventual adoption and implementation of any new ordinance. So the purpose of the workshop is to hear from interested members of the public and the council about what, if any, amendments to our existing smoking regulations we wish to undertake. Thank you, Charles. Um, I think at this point in time is appropriate to hear the public comments that we received. Um, City Clerk, can you please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. I'd be happy to. Our first public comment, there's one of, uh, this is one of three, it was from Maricel Mendoza. She writes, good evening, Mayor Gama and esteemed council members. My name is Maricel Mendoza, and I'm here on behalf of the future leaders of America. First off, happy new year to everyone. 
Today, I'm here to continue to voice my concerns about vaping, flavors, and secondhand exposure, especially in multi-unit housing. In the past couple of months, cities throughout Ventura County have taken a stand against the tobacco industry by eliminating flavored tobacco, including electronic smoking devices. However, locally, we have seen that the tobacco industry is doing everything in its power to hook a new generation of smokers by reducing prices on e-cigarette smoking devices and marketing to our youth. Flavorings in tobacco products are very concerning because they help to mask the natural harsh taste of tobacco, making it easier for youth and new smokers to begin and keep smoking tobacco. Sweet flavors like chocolate, gummy bear, cherry, apple, and cotton candy are especially appealing to youth and youth adult and young adults. Nicotine can harm the brain, which continues to develop until the age of 25. The tobacco industry knows that those who start smoking electronic cigarettes are three times more likely to start smoking traditional cigarettes. There needs to be more concern put into the rising problem of addiction, especially among youth. Furthermore, we do more to protect those who live we, I'm sorry, we must do more to protect those who live in multi-unit housing. Currently, there is no ban on smoking and vaping in multi-unit housing, and unfortunately, those who are affected the most by this are minorities. It's a travesty that we aren't doing more to protect families who have no say because they have shared communal space. Because of this, families may be more likely to be exposed to secondhand smoke. This applies even more now that parents are working from home and students are doing at home learning as well. Even if no one in your home smokes, SHS, meaning secondhand smoke, can be closer than you think. SHS smoke from your neighbor's apartment can enter your home through air vents, even through cracks in your, in your wall or floor. SHS is toxic to adults and especially to children. According to the CDC, Secondhand smoke causes stroke, lung cancer, and coronary heart disease in adults. Children who are exposed to secondhand smoke are at an increased risk for sudden infant death syndrome, acute respiratory inf infections, middle ear disease, more severe asthma, respiratory systems, symptoms, excuse me, and slowed lung growth. We must ban smoking in multi-unit housing and flavors vaping to protect families and our community members. Our second public comment comes from Jesus Ramos, and he writes, Dear Mayor Gama and fellow council members, my name is Jesus Ramos, and I am a current senior at Channel Islands High School. I have been a youth leader with the Future Leaders of America for the past four years. First and foremost, I want to thank and congratulate the City Council for enacting the tobacco retailing license in February of 2020. This decision is a step in the right direction and shows the city's commitment to providing for its constituents. However, we cannot stop there. There is still so much work to be done, and I believe that in the Port Wainimi, that in Port Wainimi, we can strive for better. We can strive for a community that is healthy, equitable, and provides its citizens with a fair and equal chance at living a healthy life. As the city stands right now, it has a grade letter of F from the American Lung Association. By passing de decisive policy changes, the city can improve its score. The city of Port Wainimi must eliminate the sale of flavored tobacco products, including mentholated cigarettes, as it has proven to be a health epidemic, not only in Port Wainimi, but in the United States. Port Wainimi is one of the cities that have yet to pass a flavored tobacco policy ban in Ventura County. If the city truly strives to create a healthy environment for all its residents, then you must move forward with this policy change. It isn't surprising that Port Wainimi has 15 tobacco retailers within a short vicinity, as it is predominantly uh, Latin. The truth is tobacco companies predatorily market towards youth with appealing flavors and to the Black, Indigenous, People of Color community. It is devastating to see that communities like Port Wainini are targeted and we need to take a stand against tobacco companies. The worldwide pandemic has highlighted the inequities in our society and the health effects of flavored tobacco is one of them we should not miss. Moreover, passing policy change that address secondhand smoke is imperative to bettering the community. More so now than ever, 
it is time to put people over profit as secondhand smoke exposure is another pressing issue. As people are required to stay home due to the pandemic, those living in multi-unit housing are at a greater risk. One's health shouldn't be determined by where they live and secondhand smoke endangers everyone, regardless of if they choose to smoke or not. This is especially alarming to me as according to the CDC, secondhand smoke exposure is higher among people with low income. That's why I urge the city to also start taking into consideration by ways in which we can improve the health of everyone in our community. By focusing efforts on eliminating the sale of flavored tobacco products and passing tobacco control policies, we can, better, we can be better as a community. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to continue to have these discussions on tobacco policy. There is still work to be done, and I truly believe that, the Port, that Port Wainimi can be a leader in health equity and set a precedent for other cities in our county. Thank you. Okay. Uh, public comment number three is from Aliana Perez, and she writes, good evening, council members. My name is Aliana Perez, and I'm a student at Pacifica High School and a youth leader with Future Leaders of America. I wanted to make a comment regarding the smoke-free ordinance you all voted on this year. Congratulations on your decision to make Port Wainimi Beach a smoke-free zone. This is a great first step towards creating a healthier environment. However, much more is needed from the council to protect our public health. As you may all know, the American Lung Association has given Port Wainimi an F letter grade this year. This report evaluated Port Wainimi's record on proven effective tobacco control policies necessary to save lives. Because of this, I urge you all to take steps further towards protecting the public health of our city. Port Wainimi must ban flavors, vaping, that target our youth and implement no smoking policies in multi-unit housing. Vaping has taken over our high schools. Before the pandemic, students would go into restrooms to vape. This would trigger our smoke alarms to go off constantly throughout the day. It happened so often that our classes wouldn't even flinch when a smoke alarm blared. It would be so bad that when you wanted to use the restroom, you'd be walking into smoke-filled stalls. These students don't understand how bad vaping affects their health. They have been manipulated to believe vaping is healthier and won't harm them. The tobacco industry has purposely made its products more attractive to youth with flavors that cover up the harshness of the nicotine. Because the tobacco industry understands that va flavor vaping is a gateway to youth addiction, they have purposely used nicotine salts instead of regular nicotine because it has a higher concentration to be inhaled and absorbed more quickly. Vaping has made a comeback for smoking in high school, and we must ban flavors because it targets our youth. Furthermore, the fact that we don't have any policies to protect our community members in multi-unit housing is heartbreaking. A ban is important to me because I have a sister and two nieces that live in MUH housing, and there is nothing in place to protect them from the harmful chemicals in smoke. Since they live in MUH, they only have to say for what happens in their home. They have no control over other residents that may be smoking close to them. Even though in their home they aren't smoking, they are still being greatly affected by the secondhand smoke that travels through vents, windows, and common areas. You may think that secondhand smoke isn't harmful, yet secondhand smoke contains hundreds of toxic chemicals in which many lead to cancer. I urge the council to choose the community's public health over profit for the tobacco industry. We must ban flavors, vaping for our youth's health, and we must ban smoking in MUH in order to protect our family and community members. And that concludes the three public comments that we received. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. My pleasure. Are there any comments or questions? I would like to um, start off by saying that cigarette butts in our weekly trash pickup cleanups are the number one item still. Um, however, I want to tell you that after the passing of the ordinance, um, I went out to the end of the pier and I picked up every cigarette butt on the pier and I counted up to, I think it was like 269. And since that time, 
Um, and when I was out there, a number of the fishermen were, were giving me a hard time. Um, and they were non-smokers, but they're saying, hey, you, you banned smoking on the pier. And I go, well, how did you know that? And then, well, we learned, you know. And But more recently, this last weekend, we went out to the end of the pier picking up cigarette butts, and we only found 31. So something positive is happening, and that's good. I mean, it's amazing to see such a dramatic decrease in the amount of cigarette butts on the pier. However, in the parking lot, it's a total different story. Um, the parking lot is having more cigarette butts than it had before. <laughs> and I think our ordinance allows smoking in the parking lot. So, I mean, it's pretty awesome to, to see this evidence that people are embracing the ordinance. However, the parking lot is um, now littered with cigarette butts. So, and I know back when this first came up, we were wondering, you know, what about the parks? Should, should we not have, if we're gonna ban smoking on the wharf, the pier and the beach, what about the parks? And so, um, I think that's where we need to consider going is, is um, having a comprehensive smoking ordinance that covers all the areas that are open to the public. And then um, I, I recall um, in Wainimi, I had a, um, I was living at Beachport Villas and um, we had a common wall and my neighbor smoked constantly. And so it's no joke that your house could smell like cigarettes if your neighbor is um, smoking inside their house. So there's no question that, that that's a problem. And so um, those are my comments and uh, I would like to recognize Council Member Hernandez and then Council Member Perez after Thank you, Mayor Gama, and thank you, uh, Marisol from the Future Leaders of America for bringing this to our attention um, last year. And uh, your work actually enabled us to um, create a, a new ordinance or amend an existing ordinance which would ban uh, flavored tobacco um, on, in elect and electronic cigarettes, um, prohibit the sale of those to minors. Now, I don't know if we passed anything related to multi-housing units, uh, prohibiting smoke in multi-housing units, but I feel that some, that would be a, a good next step. Um, I, I think I'd have to go back to Charles and find out exactly, Charles, what we, Mr. Peretz, what we adopted last year. I am not, my memory's failing me. Um, sure on the multi-unit housing issue. There, there, there were uh, no ordinances or actions taken related to multi-unit housing. The February action pertained to the uh, tobacco and electronic cigarette retailer uh, ordinance, which required a license and included certain regulations and penalties uh, for such retailers uh, and established the, the process by which they can go about getting a license. Uh, so that was the ordinance that was adopted in February. Uh, and then in September, of course, was the uh, prohibition on the smoking at the uh, beach pier and wharf. Neither of those included anything. Okay. And I wanted to thank you. Okay, and I just wanted to thank you also for um, contacting the American Lung Association on our report card and getting that corrected. Because I, I feel we put a lot of effort behind that. And uh, even though it's a C, it's better than an S. So thank you for that. That's a member Perez. Uh, mine's more of just a comment because um, I do agree with uh, the three comments that were sent in. I would love to be able to ban smoking in, in certain areas and not have people subject to secondhand smoke. Um, but I thought that January 1st, our governor did do a statewide ban on most, if not almost all flavored tobacco already. It took effect January 1st. 
It was to take effect. That's SB 793. Uh, it was passed in August of last year by the state legislature. Um, but there has been a petition, um, frankly, backed by three major tobacco companies um, to delay implementation of that and require that it go to the voters at the next general election, which would be November of 2022. So that law is not currently in effect. Got it. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins, you're on mute. Well, um, our motto is to be the friendly city by the sea. Um, in order to do that, we need to pr promote a safe and healthy environment to our community. Um, in the coming year, we're trying to be promoting uh, recreational activities for kids, encouraging them to come to the parks and cover, encouraging families to come to the parks by improving the amenities. But we're gonna, as it stands now, people are still allowed to smoke allowing that secondhand smoke to affect the, commun the community people that come to participate. Um, also, a few years ago, they did a study and we have the Port Wyneme and Ventura County as one of, if not the lowest life expectancy of any city. Uh, I can't believe that part of that is not because we've allowed smoking in the past and haven't taken steps. Um, I, uh, I just, I, I, I'm all for, I'm right now, I'm all for doing whatever we can to bend any kind of carcinogens that are known that can make our community less healthy when that's one of the goals that we're trying to do. So be it uh, electronic cigarettes or flavored tobaccos or um, uh, multi, uh, having um, cigarette smoke and multi housing. Those are all positive steps that I can see that we need to move forward. Even the uh, possible outdoor dining, if we were, uh, uh, I've seen a lot of cities that have um, enacted outdoor dining um, prohibitions of smoking and people are more attracted to those dining areas because they don't have to deal with the secondhand smoke. So I think it in the long term helps our economy in that way. Uh, so, Enough of me being on the pulpit on this. Uh, that's those are my thoughts at this point. Councilmember Martinez, I, and I, I just want to say that I second everything that uh, um, Mayor uh, Pro Tem Rollins has said, and and um, I'm I'm guessing we're all basically on the same boat, right? For the most part, certainly appears to be the case. Um, Councilmember Hernandez, I think I saw your yeah, hand. Yeah, I just yeah, I wanted to. To um, remind Councilman Rollins that at uh, the meeting where we approved the ban on smoking at the beaches, you had suggested that we do a similar ban at the parks. Um, are you, I think that's a good idea. I mean, just to dovetail on what you were just saying a, a few moments ago, is to consider banning um, cigarette smoking of, or smoking of any kind. Um, in the parks. And I think in addition to that, the multi-unit dwelling prohibits smoking and multi-unit dwellings. Um, let's see, what else What else okay. were they asking for? Okay. Uh, so, I mean, that would be something I would support at this time. Yes, um, the evolution of smoking has, um, in our lifetime, has, has really swung on the pendulum widely. And um, I recall when um, you couldn't go into a restaurant and find a non-smoking section. And as I was reading the material that was presented to us, um, the first ordinance had to do with establishing a non-smoking section in a restaurant. And so look how far we've come since then, you know, um, there was a large debate about, you know, how can we do that? And um, I think everyone nowadays is keenly aware that cigarette smoking has no, um, it does nothing good for your health. <laughs> and um, 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 I, think, uh, I think it's time that um, we, have a smoking ordinance that um, 
addresses all the public areas. And I, I brought up the, the parking lot at the beach. Um, you know, you come with your family and you pull your car up and you park and you're unloading the kids and somebody's right next to you, or maybe there's cars on both sides of you with people smoking cigarettes. I mean, you know, it, it really is a, is it just ruins, you know, the first five minutes of your arrival at the beach. So um, I am really glad that we're having this workshop and um, um, because I um, feel like we do need to have an ordinance that covers all the other public areas that are widely used by people that come into our city. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins. And to kind of re reiterate what you all are saying in one of the previous proposals that came up was as we hopefully begin to ban smoking in many of these places, for the people come to our city that are unaware of that we have a no, hopefully have a no smoking ordinance, they need a place to put their cigarette butts. And uh, earlier, uh, the Surfrider Foundation pr presented a proposal that they would provide free of charge um, butt dispensers so that as they come onto that parking lot and they're made aware that they aren't allowed to smoke, they don't just dump them on the parking lot. They, in fact, put them into places where they dispensers are and that um that i think they were also promoting that you know they have people and also within our community volunteers that will help promote this whole cause which is a good thing so uh while that's not directly tied into the smoking ordinance if we move forward on these things it's a good uh safety measure so that we can even further um deal with like the bad parts of smoking the okay. trash and if i may can can we have a definition on a on the multi what, what is it <laughs> multi-unit housing um i can attempt it uh <clears throat> kevin i'm not sure or or tony if you have a, a more specific definition but I've seen uh, ordinances that are specific to condominiums uh, and apartments. Some cities have them separated out, but I believe the term multi-unit housing uh, would encompass both of those types of residences. So if, if there's a two-story apartment building and, and the bottom floor being um, a separate unit from the top floor, then that ban would be no smoking inside the apartments, is that correct? That's my understanding, but I believe we would also have the opportunity to provide definitions of, of that term within our ordinance, but uh, I, I really, I see Kevin has unmuted himself and perhaps can enlighten me. Uh, Mayor Gama and Charles, the traditionally multi-unit housing or multi-family housing consists of, of dwellings that share common walls. So a duplex, a triplex, an apartment complex, things of that nature would be considered multi-unit housing. I'm sure the city's municipal code has a specific definition in its zoning ordinances. Uh, I just don't have that handy right now at the moment. Um, but that would be ostensibly the thing. The other, the other issue that I kind of wanted to address, because we're talking a lot about banning smoking inside private residences, uh, I have not made a determination whether or not we have the authority to do that. The slide that was given uh, to this council during this presentation by Charles was banning smoking in multi-use housing common areas. The same would likely be true of, of private vehicles. Once we start getting into regulating personal conduct within people's homes, we start running into significant first 14th Amendment violation issues. And so these things would require significant legal research to see exactly what the breadth of the city's authority could be. Kevin? I have yes. a question. So, uh, assuming there is some kind of limitation towards, you know, dealing what people do in their private residence, um, we also have ordinances that you, you have to provide uh, smoke detectors, uh, fire extinguishers, things like that. Um, would that, I mean, if we allowed people to smoke in their private residences could 
would there be the ability legally to have um, uh, devices that would eliminate the smoke, similar to like what they do in the cannabis operations to eliminate that smoke to go into the community? It's entirely possible, but we're starting to get into state mandated building code regulations and we run into issues of state preemption. Typically, uh, typically, when you start looking at state law as it applies to local authority, if the state has extensive regulation on subject matter, they intend to occupy the field and there is no room left for the local agency to regulate. Uh, we see this a lot in, um, uh, right now we're seeing it a lot in ADU regulations with land use and whatnot. The state has grabbed more and more power uh, and, and has left very little room for cities to actually operate. And that becomes the issue when we start imposing building code regulations and things like that. Uh, it would require significantly more research. It would also likely implicate constitutional conditions and all sorts of other issues as to how we would exact some of these things, let alone the enforcement issues as to gaining entrance into private residences to inspect for these devices. Okay. I, I know one thing I would make a comment as to whatever ordinances that we promote that um, I would hope that, you know, we wouldn't be so gung ho on it that uh, we don't uh, put pressure on the police to make this a, a major priority as to things that I think are probably a lot more important things that they need to do. Thank you, Council Member Hernandez. Yeah, I I wanted to confirm that um, Mar Vista and the um, other housing that we own as a city, do we already prohibit smoking in those um, dwellings? I believe we do. I believe we do as well. I remember there was a big discussion at Mar Vista about creating a smoking area so that um, uh, the residents who do smoke would have to go outside to smoke. Yeah. Um, Charles, um, Mr. Peretz, can you confirm that? Or is Gabby on? I don't uh, see Gabby on. G Gabby's not on right now. Um, I would have to review the ordinance and get back to you. That issue did not uh, come up uh, in my review, but I can confirm that and, and advise. Okay. I was just in light of what Kevin was saying. I know that we during certain buildings, but then we get into issues and um, constitutional rights. Uh, so on others, so that, but that would be something that we should really consider doing if it's not done already. And Council Member Hernandez, uh, to answer your question, because the city owns that or subsidizes that, we have much more authority with respect to what the, the land use and regulations that we can do at Marvis. Right. That's what I would imagine. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins. Just to add one more thing, uh, the morbidity rate for COVID is so much higher with than for people who have various different pre-existing lung conditions and stuff like that. So anything we, that we can do to protect our community uh, by creating an environment that they uh, can not get these lung diseases, I think is good overall. Are there any other comments or questions? Council members? Um, I, go ahead. I think the question and uh, ask Mr. Peretz is if he feels comfortable with the information and the guidance that we've given him so far. Um, are we giving you enough direction here on next steps? I think there's been <clears throat> very good dialogue uh, and very uh, clear ideas on what the council wants. Um, what I heard though is there's kind of concerns in different uh, different purposes. Uh, I did hear um, something about prohibit, prohibiting outdoor um, smoking uh, for dining purposes, which may be a benefit uh, to businesses and may make it more desirable for people to, um, to uh, dine in Port Wyneme. Uh, I certainly heard plenty about 
concerns about public health impacts uh, secondhand smoke and, and impacts to uh, uh, individuals for public health and safety. Uh, there was also discussion about youth. Um, and as we know, our beach ordinance was primarily based uh, on environmental concerns. Um, so I think, uh, and Kevin can help me out here, I think it's easiest if we identify uh, one or two of those main purposes as the basis for the ordinance. Um, and then all the prohibitions would tie into that basis so that it is a legally defensible local law. Yes, I think the most important um, aspect of this is to not, um, you know, the bridge too far. Um, we're not talking about um, telling people what they can and can't do in the privacy of their own home. But um, if I'm a landlord and I'm going to rent okay, to not somebody, a protected liberty right. Yeah, I could I could say, look, I don't want you to smoke in the a condition of me renting my house to you is you don't smoke inside and they sign that agreement and so that that's far different than the city saying nobody can smoke inside a building now the city owns buildings and i am pretty confident that in regards to mar vista that because of the proximity of all those 60 people in that building that the city put in place, you cannot smoke in, as a condition of, of, of living here, you cannot smoke in, in your um, apartment, but you could go outside and smoke. So um, uh, the, we, I think we all, there's agreement that in public areas like parks, the beach, even the beach parking lot, um, for the reasons I stated, I think, I think we all, um, I think we all are pretty clear on that it is a nuisance to um, a family coming to the beach to have to, you know, wade through a cloud of vape or smoke just to get, you know, to the walkway out to the beach. And I, I think that we all agree that, um, I mean, it certainly appears that that having an ordinance that um, protects people in public areas is is what we're attempting to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, except I don't agree necessarily with banning the smoking in parking lots. We already banned it on the beach and we banned it on the pier. I'm not so certain that going as far as banning smoking in the parking lot um, would be a good idea. I mean, well, I mean, the other side that smokers have rights, they have, a, they have the opportunity to stop smoking in their car and really hopefully get rid of the cigarette butt in one of their cans. Um, but I don't know that I would go so far. So Please don't say that we all agree at this point because I'm not. We haven't had that discussion about um, about well, the beach parking. Correct, and and the discussion has been secondhand smoke, and I think we all agree that secondhand smoke is is not something that someone should have to deal with in the public arena. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Councilmember Martinez. Yeah, piggybacking on what council member uh, Laura and Edis had said, I, that's one of the things that I was thinking about. Um, you know, we we banned it everywhere else. And, you know, I mean, I mean, we do kind of have a right to cater to every all, all, everyone in the city. Right. So I was just thinking, I mean, where where would we would we put an area where, you know, it's smoking is allowed? I, you know, that's just kind of one of the things that I was thinking about. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm still gathering all kinds of different thoughts, you know? Yeah. Looking, so. looking back to like, I remember when I was in high school and the advent of non-smoking areas in restaurants was hotly debated, just like we're debating right now. And it was a, it was a big step for local governments to say, okay, you, you have to have a non-smoking section in your restaurant. Now remember the debate about that. It was it was quite quite lively and spirited. Maybe like not all the parking lots. Maybe there could be a one parking lot, or you know, where you know that's where smoking is allowed, and then we can have a bunch of um, you know trash cans specifically for them, so they can so they can throw out the cigarette butts. Because even like how you mentioned, Mayor Gama, there's a ton of more cigarette butts on the parking lot now. I mean, the purpose is. For them to clean up after themselves and and not create trash, and and maybe um, 
maybe keep them, you know, isolated in some area. I, I don't know. These are just ideas that I'm, I'm, I'm getting right now. So um, I, I like the point that um, City Council Member Laura Hernandez had brought up. You know, just, but I still think we're all like on the same idea. Like we, we don't, we don't want people to have the side effects of secondhand smoke. And I think, especially in, in multi-housing, we, we really don't want them smoking in those areas for, uh, for kids, right? So um, to get affected. So I, I, that's, that's kind of where I stand, but I'm, I'm still trying to, you know, cater to everyone, you know, and that's, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with both of you. Like, yes, this is a, you know, you have your personal freedoms. However, now picture the family of five kids all below the age of 10 come to the beach parking lot and they're on both sides of them. They got cars full of people smoking. I mean, that's secondhand smoke. That's exposing young kids to secondhand smoke. And, and we just heard from our three public comments that that's a major component of, you know, our bad grade. And so, um, you know, I don't, I, I just, you know, I don't, I would hate for us to have a, a, that situation where a family is, you know, gets out of their car and this big heap of smoke is just going, you know, cause the wind's going to determine which way it goes. And sometimes, you know, we all know when we're down at the beach, if you're on the wrong side of the wind, you know, it comes right in your face. So that's just something that I think we need to keep in mind. Council member Perez. Yes. Um, so I agree in part with council member Martinez and Hernandez and mayor pro tem Rollins that I think, um, since we are representatives of all the people in our city and we do have a group of people or a large portion that do still smoke, we need to find some way of having a happy medium where we can still protect the public to a certain extent and having people have their right to smoke if they still want to. Uh, so a specially designated area for smoking at the beach area or the parking lot or like some other idea like that, I would be in favor of. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted um, to point out in uh, the state of Hawaii, they're pretty uh, restrictive on smoking and particularly at the airports. And um, they have a designated smoking area in the parking lot of the airport. And, you know, it's just this little square. And if you want to smoke your cigarette, you go stand in that square. And they're very aggressive in in uh, in ticketing people at the airport because, you know, secondhand smoke. You know, people are coming to paradise, and then you you know you're carrying your luggage, and you got somebody blowing smoke in your face, and and so I, I think perhaps there's a way for us to to find a workable solution to this issue, um, and I think it would definitely center around a designated smoking area in a parking lot. Uh, Council Member Hernandez. Yeah, I just wanted to enc encourage everybody to go to the American Lung Association um, website and uh, go to uh, grades um, and you can look by county. Um, we can see grade is still there, I believe. Um, but I hope, I'm hoping that changes soon. I guess it's going to change for 2021. But it'll so, show you the areas uh, upon which we're graded. And it doesn't say anything about parking lots, but um, entryways um, and non-smoking common areas are um, uh, part of the, the point process or, or the point criteria. But I wanted to really just get back to um, what the three public comments were about. And one of them was banning um, flavored cigarettes um, and I think e-cigarettes, um, Mr. Pretz, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I can't pull up their the public comments on online right now. I can't find them, but that's the discussion I think we need to have is whether or not we want to ban th the sale of those in its entirety because the last uh, ordinance that we, thank you very much, the last ordinance that we updated or or uh, approved had to do with selling to minors. Um, now we're being asked to uh, ban these items altogether. So I think that's a discussion we need to have. 
uh, as to where we want to go with that. Do, are we looking to find some kind of compromise, some uh, some balance here between, um, you know, what the businesses can sell and not sell? Um, I think we need to have that discussion. I don't know if that's for tonight, but um, I just, I think it's something we need to, to look at. Yes, Member Martinez, you're on mute. No, I, I, I don't have any, any comments right now. But I'm sorry, I thought you raised your hand. Um, so on that banning of, I, I guess, um, Council Member Hernandez, we are, you're talking about banning the sale of flavored vaping products and tobacco products. And the only question I have is what would happen to that business that has been approved that's up and running and paying their fees and their taxes in the city of Port Wainimi? Um, you know, would we put them out of business or would we grandfather them in or, or what exactly are we um, talking about? That's exactly what we need to talk about. How far do we want to go? Do we want to make a... Um, a total ban on the sale of those items because it will have an economic impact on our businesses. And I'm really concerned about having, creating any more economic, negative economic impact on our businesses in light of COVID and the and everything that they've gone through at this point. So uh, my hope was would be that we find um, a happy medium somewhere when we come to um, looking at this, uh, the banning of, and sale of these these items. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins. Um, currently, we don't ban cigarettes for adults, regardless of, and we don't, and uh, my my. That's thought, not what they're asking, though. No, no. That's not well, what the public. Yeah, that's not what they're asking. Well, aren't they asking about banning uh, flavored tobaccos? Is that yes. correct? Okay. Yes. So we don't ban cigarettes for adults, I would tend to think we don't ban flavored tobaccos for adults, keeping along the same line. They're both unhealthy for adults, but we still allow them to be sold. What I think the purpose of a lot of this discussion is where they're allowed to do unhealthy actions that affect the entire community. And that's where we move into like, you know, uh, I mean, I kind of had some credence to what Ms. Uh, Mayor Gama had said regarding smoking in a parking lot. If I pull into a parking lot my first time at Wainimi Beach and it's full of smoke, that's not a good thing for my family or uh, the appearance of what Wainimi Beach is all about. Um, well, okay, yeah. well, that, those are my Go thoughts. ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, th then also, if you're, uh, we were talking a little bit about dining areas. Uh, I think they've done a lot of different research where like, uh, I don't, uh, dining areas aren't hurt dramatically because they create a ban of outdoor smoking in their outdoor dining areas. Now, I'm not sure right now if um, an individual restaurant can make that decision on their own or whether or not that's something that the city needs to be involved in. So, but comment to what you were saying about the uh, earlier. Well, well, first of all, this is not what the, the future leaders of America are talking about necessarily with regards to our beach parking. Uh, I think they want to see us have common, no smart smoking areas, but it's, you know, maybe that's a way to address the parking lot issue, but absent of that, uh, I would be concerned if I pulled into a parking lot and there was no place to park with every, because there was so many cars with everybody smoking. But if I pulled up next to a car and I had kids or elderlies in, in my vehicle and I pulled up next to a car where smoke was just bellowing out of the windows, I would move. But I, I think we're drawing a picture here for people 
who come to the beach that they're going to pull up in the parking lot and every car is going to have this billowing smoke coming out of it. I mean, we, we live in a society right now that's very diverse and, and people smoke. So we have to be able, we can't just ban it and say no because it's unhealthy for them. We don't do that to alcohol. We don't do that to other things. We have to find a happy medium is, is what I'm saying. And, and, and we have and to they find would, They would still do it also, right? I mean, I think they would still smoke. And, and I had a question for um, Chief Salinas. H how would he go about enf enforcing, you know, the banning of the smoking on the, on the beach? Or, or how, how, do, how do they go about doing that right now? So uh, we, these types of laws kind of really rely on self-regulation and people just to adhere to the code of law. Uh, there are cert certain situations where uh, if it is prevalent and let's say there were smokers on the pier and people were bothered by it, you know, people would call the police and we would go out and then use the authority of the ordinance to get people to put out their cigarettes and they would probably actually get a citation as well. So it's not something that we actively pursue unless there's a complaint. Uh, it's right before us. Um, and again, we, we rely on people just to simply regulate themselves and adhere to our laws in our, in our community. And, and see, that's why I was thinking if, if we do give them a place to smoke and people know like, hey, that's, let's just say it's a parking lot. Right now we're just saying parking lot, right? And, um, I th and, and we put trash cans for them to put their cigarette buds. I think we can keep the, most of the beach clean and, and most of the people happy where, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really think that there's a lot of people smoking anyways. Maybe I'm obli oblivious to that because um, I'm, maybe I'm not having been paying attention to it. Um, but I don't really think that that's an issue, like too much of an issue. Um, so if we can basically, you know, give them a place, at least that's kind of what I'm thinking. And then in, in regards to um, the flavored, you know, tobacco, um, I, I, I mean, I've never taken a trip out to that business here in Wainimi that, that sells tobacco. I almost feel like um, it would be nice to hear from them also. Um, never walked in. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I just kind of swayed around it and I, it makes me kind of um, think that maybe I should go check it out or I don't know, it'd be nice to hear what the rest of the public's saying. I, I do think, you know, from an educator's perspective and me growing up, you know, as, as a child thinking like, hey, you know, I don't, I don't want smoke around me. And I, and I think that that's true. We, we don't want the smoke around the youth. And so in, in around those um, multifamily uh, housing, we should, we should, they should, we should, I think we should ban it. And um, I, I, I think that we're discussing a bunch of different things at once, right? Where it's, it's like, I think it's almost three, like banning the, the flavored um, tobacco, uh, banning the smoking in these homes. And then we're also talking about banning, you know, smoking at the parks and, um, and I think, yeah, maybe we should ban. I think we should ban smoking at the parks, but maybe if there's like, let's just say one place in Port Wainimi that people know, like, like Mayor Gama said, like there's this one little square in the airport, you know, um, maybe we would have the rest of the place clean. And then there's just that one place, you know, that people go to. That's just what I'm thinking. Mayor, <clears throat> can I jump in for a moment? Yeah, yes, sir, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, you know, a couple of comments have been made, and I and I wanted to let the council know that um, because we had some interested parties that spoke and have provided public comment over the last year or so, I just wanted to let everybody know we did reach out to uh, individuals that had previously commented either in writing or at uh, meetings of the city council because we wanted uh, to hear from them. And I and I heard a couple of the council uh, members suggest, uh, yeah, it would be beneficial. And I just wanted to bring one thing up back in February when the uh, tobacco and e-cigarette license, uh, retailer license ordinance was debated and, and passed. Um, one of the, uh, I'm sorry, not one of them, there were a couple of business owners that came and spoke at that time. Uh, and I am neither advocating nor opposed to their position, but I just wanted to share with the council that at that time, they did express that uh, they were supportive of the license requirement, but banning the sale of tobacco would be extremely impactful to their business operations. And I believe one even indicated that he would probably have to close up shop because it is a predominant share of his uh, 
business uh, is the sale of, of flavored tobacco. And, and Councilmember Martinez, I think your recent comments are, are right on the mark. We are talking about a number of different things. So to try to coalesce all of the discussion that we've had, I think one of the primary issues that we, that we that the council has discussed is a concern about the secondhand smoke and the public health impacts that smoking has on members of the public. And I think that uh, we as staff can work on a draft ordinance uh, focused on that. Um, we would certainly present something to council and, and, and not all council members may agree on all prohibitions. Uh, so the proposal could be amended over time, but if that is the objective, if the primary concern is public health and safety, uh, we can draft a uh, uh, an ordinance that includes prohibitions to mitigate uh, adverse impacts to public health. So for me, the absent of the parks in our current ordinance was why I was the lone vote against the ordinance to begin with, because I felt like, look, let's, if we're going to do, if we're going to ban smoking at the beach, then we should ban smoking at the parks for the very same reasons. Um, and um, uh, the parking lot issue, like, you know, what if um, a family's in the parking lot and then here comes a van full of smokers pulls right up next to that family, you know? So, so it works both ways. You know, you could park somewhere else, but what if they park next to you? And so um, I, I, I think uh, our, our ordinance, I think our ordinance is well uh, founded, but what I didn't like about it was that it left parks out of it. And, and so um, anyways, Mayor Pro Tem Rollins. Okay, um, I would agree towards ordinances with the emphasis on improving our safe, safety and welfare within the community. Um, I would, um, I guess, concede to finding a, a no smoking location where people could smoke. Um, uh, I, I voted for the original one that only included the beach only because I was hoping this, uh, I was disappointed there, but it was the first step and hopefully after this long discussion, the second step will coalesce and we will include the parks and some of the other public areas that have been discussed. Council Member Hernandez. Yeah, I, I think if you recall, the reason that that ordinance was um, presented on the no smoking at the beaches was because of uh, Mayor Gama's work every weekend and the um, continuous reports we would get back from him regarding the cigarette butts. And so that was a solution to address the cigarette butts. Yeah. But um, I would support banning smoking in parks. Um, I think we need to look at the flavored tobacco electronic cigarette issue. I, I not, I'm not in favor of putting anybody out of business, but if we can find a happy medium there, um, which I think we did by uh, not allowing them to sell to minors, I, I, I think we might want to leave that alone. I'll, I'll venture out to say that. Um, but the multi-unit housing, I think um, if we could look at that and see if there's ways that we could um, do something there, I, I think that would be worth looking at. I think I heard um, our city attorney say that um, with regards to buildings that we own, yes, we could ban smoking indoors. Mm -hmm. However, what people do in the privacy of their own homes is a whole different scenario. Yes, we certainly well, don't. Yes, I understand that. Yes. I'm just trying to give our staff some direction on what areas to focus on. Um, and that would mm -hmm. certainly be a consideration. Councilmember. Mayor Gama, this is, oh, I'm sorry. This is Kevin Spaulding. If I may, just to, to see if I can help clarify some of this, what staff's really looking for is we're looking for direction on what the, the evils to be avoided are from the council. So for example, the tobacco retailers license ordinance came about as a direct result of the future leaders of America highlighting problems about minors gaining access to tobacco mm -hmm. products. So the central theme of that ordinance is to establish a licensing procedure by which if a business is found selling or making accessible tobacco products to minors, 
the city has the option to shut that business down. And so we were confronted with a problem and a concern, which was sale of tobacco products to minors, and the city had a narrow and focused response to it. The same is true of the beach and vape ordinance in that the concern was, if you read the recitals of that ordinance, it's the harmful effects of fish and wildlife with tobacco products and a lot of that stuff. The concern was not secondhand smoke. It was not public health. So where we go on these conversations as far as what ordinance we should be looking at is what is the evil to be solved here? And from what I get is I hear a lot of public health, secondhand smoke is toxic. We should look into multi-use housing and other areas where people live or work in a sort of communal environment because we are trying to protect pulmonary health, okay? So we can start looking at banning in public rights of ways, in public parks and this and that. I'm also hearing that we're concerned about litter. And so from, from a staff or a drafting perspective for these ordinances, it, it helps not so much to focus on whether or not there's an area in the street where people can smoke, but more so on what is it this council really wants to address? What evils in this city are you trying to to avoid or rectify, and then giving staff that ability and the broader picture allows us to look at those areas and come back with a very comprehensive and well thought out ordinance as to how we can get the most bang for our buck with the regulation we're moving forward. Mayor Pro Tem Rollins, or actually, hold on a second. Um, Council Member Perez, you had your hand up earlier. Yes, so um, with regards to banning smoking in multi-unit housing, there are some cities that have done so because uh, the constitution says that there's no constitutional right to smoke. So there's an interesting article um, that I read recently on that, um, which I will leave that to our attorney to look into further. Um, but one thing that was brought up in the letters was talking about smoking in schools and how so they go into the bathroom and it's full of smoke and they can't breathe. And I was wondering how this was being allowed with school officials and what can we do? What can, what can we do with regards to that? Like what is not being done on school campuses that's allowing this many students to be able to vape in the bathrooms or vape in, in other areas? Um, I do agree with uh, Councilmember Hernandez. I'm not in favor of someone losing their livelihood and shutting down a business. I unfortunately think eventually it's going to be put to the voters um, the next voting session and it may be voted against an entire state ban automatically without you know, our input into it. Um, and I am in favor of no smoking on parks and in favor of designated areas in the public areas, but um, I do think we need to have um, more discussion on it. Uh, I don't think it's as easy as as just what we're doing right now. So I think more research um, and needs to be presented first. I would like to see it. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Rollins. Uh, developing ordinances with the main theme of reducing litter and improving health I think that would be the direction that we should give staff. Um, I also agree that since it's legal to sell cigarettes to adults, just like it's, it's and it's legal to sell uh, flavored tobaccos for adults, I don't think we should eliminate that or create any kind of ordinance that would prevent a business from doing what is legally able to do, they're able to do right now. Mm. Yeah. Councilmember Martinez. Yes, sir. Um, am, am I allowed to ask uh, for Chief Salinas's uh, opinion and um, Mr. Connors's opinion? Absolutely. Uh, hi. So uh, I'm a big believer of, of small steps and moving forward. I, I, I'd love to see the uh, an ordinance that uh, bans smoking in our parks and our local parks, especially that's where our youth. Uh, primarily congregate, especially in our local parks here where we have basketball courts, little league fields uh, of that nature. Uh, it, it does get a little more technical with uh, multi-use housing, uh, 
Um, but I, I would like to, you know, start there at least, uh, and then kind of start making incremental progress uh, towards this. And I think uh, parks is a good place to start. Mr. City Manager. Yes, thank you. From the Fighter pilot. Jeez, <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. Um, um, you know, I, we've gone from ubiquitous uh, smoking um, impositions uh, to a little bit more narrow. So there's, uh, I, I'm kind of uh, along the lines, I think, uh, uh, parks um, and, 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 and common right of ways are a, a good start and then uh, kind of a move from there. And, and I like that, actually, I like both of your guys' answers of, in terms of making progress and making, you know, positive steps. Um, that's, that's, that's good. Well, thank you all for a live. I have one more. I have okay. one more comment, if I could. Okay. Just to leave you thinking about this, I I think about the hypocrisy that we will face in the fact that we are supporting our cannabis businesses, but on the other hand, we are affecting the livelihood, potentially affecting the livelihood of the smoke and vape shops. There is. There is some conflict there, some hypocrisy there, you know, if we go that route. So I think we need to really find some balance in how we approach this. And I do agree with the, the slow one step at a time. You know, I, I remember um, Paul Flores coming in from Vape Forest and he said, I welcome the regulation. I want to play by the rules. And, and that's what we've asked of our cannabis operators is, look, here's the rule book play by the rules and you're going to be fine. And so um, when we're talking about, we're talking about health, we're talking about smoking I know we're and talking, I'm putting talking things about, in our lungs. I'm and, talking and about your, your comment of hypocrisy. Yeah. And what I'm trying to, to articulate is that our dispensaries follow the rules and Paul Flores from Vape Forrest came in and said, I want regulation. I want to follow the rules. I want to be operating legally, respectfully, and, and I welcome the, the, the oversight. And so I think, I think uh, again, Chief has done a wonderful job in, and we just heard about how, how we qualified, how we made uh, all the dispensaries keenly aware of the rules and we hold them accountable. And I think, I think, um, in terms of the, the other shops that we need to do the same and kind of mirror what, what we've done with cannabis. Um, and um, hopefully we could be seen as not being hypocritical, but being, being fair-minded and um, um, holding people accountable to, our, to the rules. Any other comments? Yeah, let's uh, let's work on getting our grades up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we doing our final, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is a great way to end this discussion, and I hope that uh, unless anyone has further questions or more comments, um, I, I think and staff, please let us know. I, I think. Uh, I think we've given you a lot, probably more so than you need, but a lot to uh, to consider and, and when you bring this thing back to us. Yes, sir. Any other comments, questions? Move to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Move to adjourn. <laughs> okay. So we have a uh, motion to adjourn this meeting. Let me get my notes correct. Is there a, a second on adjournment? I think this is a public hearing, is it not? Public, this is a, uh, not a public hearing, this is a workshop. Okay. Okay, so uh, unless anyone has any additional comments or recommendations for staff, um, would like to uh, adjourn this meeting to our next regular city council meeting, which will be um, January 19th, a Tuesday, because of the Martin Luther holiday. And hopefully I did this correct. So the city council will adjourn to the regular meeting of January 19th, 2021 to be held at 6.30 p.m. 
broadcast live from the City Hall Council Chambers. However, we're in a COVID environment and we will again be uh, conducting that meeting through Zoom. Thank, thank you all for- uh, Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good discussion. Good night. Bye. Thank you all.